You can call our recruitment team at 216-623-5233. That's 216-623-5233. And one of our recruiters will connect you with Corey and will get you in line for a great career. Thank you both. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good day, Cleveland.
All right, let's get started. Yes, I have. I'm prepared to. Man, I'm up right on like two hours of sleep. I'm, I'm hurt today, Jack. Good afternoon. Today is Monday, September the 26th. This Committee of Finance, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is called to order. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Here. Present. Fisher. Conwell. Harrison. Casey. Present. Thank you so much. I believe we have a couple of guests with us today. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm going to ask if Director Jackson can join us at the table with a couple of her guests, and then we'll go into the Film Commission uh, piece, and then we'll go into um, what I affectionately call uh, the Councilman Casey piece. How are you doing today, Director? I'm fine. Hi. Right. Good. Could you remind me of the two, six? Seven 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 sixty two seven sixty two two zero two two. It's the film commission. Okay, uh, I'm gonna do seven seven two first, and then I'll do seven sixty two. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank wait, you. Wait. Seven seven two. Seven seven two. Okay. So that's my. Yeah. Do me a favor. Have somebody call house. Tell her to come down. Her pieces up. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, please uh, join us at the table, director. How are you today? All right, uh, so today we're going to hear to begin uh, this session is ordinance number 772-2022 by council members House, Harrison and Griffin by departmental request an emergency ordinance authorizing the director of economic development to enter into a tax increment financing agreement with 3614 Euclid Holding LLC and or its designee to support the financing and development of the Delta Hotel project to be located at 3614 Euclid Avenue to provide for payments to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and to declare certain improvements to real property to be a public purpose. Director, do you want to introduce your guest and then go into this piece? Good afternoon um, to the chair, th um, to the council, to the chair. Um, first, I on my left, I have Sean Byrne, who is an attorney for Crimson Rock, which is a developer for the project. I also have Bill Garvey, who will talk about the film commission next, and Robin Brown, who's my senior project manager, who's been working on this project. Okay, thank you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so please uh, tell us a little bit about this project before we deliberate. Well, the, the, through the chair to the council, the Delta Hotel is the redevelopment of a vacant property by Crimson Rock. They are going to be doing 188 rooms and 19 suites. It's, it's a little unique in that they're the, the, the customer model centers more around medical tourism than regular tourism, and it takes advantage of the fact it's proximity to the Cleveland Clinic. It also is going to have some outward-facing amenities, including a grab-and-go store, as well as a restaurant. So there's going to be some community benefits. Uh, I like this project because of the actual how the developers have put together the capital stack. They actually have a lot of skin in the game. They have seven million in equity for a, I think it's like thirty-nine million dollar project. They're just coming to us for a TIF. They're not coming to us for a bunch of incentives. Um, it's a sophisticated developer. It's a new brand for Marriott. That's. Um, out of Canada, it's a Canada um, brand that Marriott acquired. So overall, I like the project. I hope the council will support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, does your guest, Mr. Byrne, want to say anything before we move forward, or Ms. Brown? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are very appreciative of, uh, of uh, the possibility of uh, getting a TIF through uh, the C and the city's support of the project. Our, my client's very excited to work in the community has already uh, met a few times with um, Congresswoman House um, to make sure that they are engaged in the community. And that is something that's been important to uh, Mr. Rodriguez and, and his team 
on, on their projects around the country. Okay. Ms. Brown, did you want to add anything? Okay, thank you. Um, so very familiar with this uh, project. I know it was very time sensitive. Thank you for your patience. Um, just a couple of things. We have a lot of hotels that we're starting to build in the city of Cleveland. How do you guys make sure that the demand is there so that we know that this hotel is actually going to perform the way that it actually is uh, scheduled to perform? And please, um, once again, direct all comments to the chair, and I'll make sure the appropriate councilman acts that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our, our, our team um, has a lot of hotel experience. Uh, doing hotel developments around the country and, ho and managing hotels. And they believe that uh, because of their proximity to the clinic um, and because of their proximity, their location and, and the quality of the uh, Delta Marriott brand, that they will be able to be very successful in this location. Um, they, they look at this as a great opportunity to, to rehabilitate um, uh, what have been a hotel that have really fallen into disrepair, and this is a, a great opportunity to take a historic building and turn it into something that will really serve that community well, and they believe that there is uh, more than sufficient demand, uh, especially with their location. What is the total amount for the cost? Uh, approximately $39.2 million. Okay. And how many employees do we anticipate will be there? Do we have that in there? Um, 40. 40. Okay. All right. Um, I don't, uh, the only other thing that I have is this, this isn't an extended stay or is it an extended stay or I don't know the different categories of hotels. Do you know? Uh, it, it is not an extended stay, um, uh, but, but it certainly is um, intended to be uh, comfortable for, for people who need to stay for several days, but it's not like a, um, it's out with sort of the extended stay model where you're there for weeks on end. Okay, thank you. Oh. Director? Um, um, Chairman um, Griffin, I was going to just say that it's, a, it's, it's billed as a full service hotel, Great. but it does have 19 suites for you know, a more comfortable stay, let's say. Great, great. This was heard in uh, Development Planning and Sustainability. Chairman Harrison, did you have any comments? Thank you so much. Councilwoman House, this is in your ward. Uh, do you have any comments or do you support this project? Yep, I support this uh, project. Um, the team has been very um, engaged with the community of just at least explaining things to the community, what is to be expected, really trying to look for how to create community partnerships and um, understanding when you under looking at the Marriott brand, it is very, very, very difficult for communities to get um, some of these um, uh, niche type of um, um, things. So I'm look, really looking forward for uh, the Delta Hotel to come to Cleveland and being part of Ward 7. So we support it. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Harrison, did you have any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll be brief. This has been heard and vetted through DPS committee. In fact, this was not the first time we have saw this project. They came to us before. Uh, the actual developer himself, Mr. Rodriguez, appeared before the committee to discuss the project. Uh, they presented drawings. They presented site plans. They presented uh, a lot of information that the committee was very pleased with, uh, including the responses and how they intend to work with the community. So uh, the committee passed this unanimously, and we asked for the Finance Committee support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Byrne, thank you very much uh, for appearing here again today. Um, but just like I had a, a question for you at DPS, I have that same question for finance, and I would hope that you'd be able to, to give a little bit more clarification, and that is the Delta Hotel. Um, who have they chosen as their electric supplier? Uh, uh, to the chairman, um, uh, to, to, to the uh, commissioner, through the chairman, uh, they are currently using the Illuminating Company, but I would not characterize it as a, as a choice that had been consciously made yet. If that's who they have been using. They are certainly um, open to considering other options, including certainly Cleveland Power. Um, uh, they, they, haven't, they haven't made that final decision yet. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
And just one other thing that I did want to make sure that I ask, and I, I see that you're going to have like an outdoor courtyard, you're going to have a grab and go Delta pantry, you're going to have a fitness room. Um, how would you define or how did you look at community benefits through this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, our client wanted to make sure to engage the community in a couple different ways. One of them was through, uh, through job opportunities, both during construction and post-construction during the operating of the hotel. Also, we believe that the, the restaurant um, will be, they're going to try to focus on having the restaurant serve both the hotel and the community and engage the community in, in regular activity through that so that they are aware of what's, you know, opportunities available for employment or other opportunities that arise through the operation of the hotel. That's great. Well, thank you. And uh, seeing no other questions, oh, Councilman Bishop. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, in, the, um, in the description, it says to declare certain improvements to real property to, to be uh, a public purpose. Can you explain what, why are these improvements to this, to this property going to be designated a public purpose? Uh, uh, to the councilman through the chair. Uh, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 5709.41, uh, uh, um, a, a, what's called a 41 TIF allows for a, a broad definition of public improvements, which, which include um, buildings that will generate additional tax revenue that um, improves the uh, tax collections in the air, you know, for that, for that. Uh, so under, as a 41 TIF, uh, the building and other related improvements are considered public improvements uh, for the purposes of being TIF eligible and, and being TIF eligible expenditures uh, for which um, the TIF can be, can reimburse. Um, it's really a statutory construct under state law. Okay, through the chair. So the public purpose is, uh, you, you say it's the, the true definition of a TIF, you say? Uh, to the chair. Um, the statutory provision, so there are two different TIF statutory provisions. One is a 40B TIF and the other is a 41 TIF. In the 41 TIF, so long as the city is in title, um, during doing urban redevelopment um, at some point prior to the approval of the TIF, um, then the improvements to the property can constitute what are considered to be public improvements under state law. Um, it's really a state law construct um, under, say, under as a 41 TIF, and so um, that's why they're considered, quote, public improvements, which would include um, more than just uh, under private improvements, you know, it normally under 40B, you'd have to, it would only, you know, land acquisition and then traditional public improvements, you know, utilities and, and water sewer roads would qualify. Under a 41 TIF, there's a broader definition of what constitutes a public improvement um, under the Ohio Revised Code. It's really just, a, it's really a statutory construct? Yeah. Sure, um, I understand that. If we could, um, uh, Director, because you'll probably get this question from um, several I was going to, um, through the, ch um, to the council member, through the chair to the council member, um, kind of simply put, in this case, economic development investment is considered a public purpose and has a public benefit. So that's the benefit you're getting. Traditionally with a TIF, we think about it as infrastructure investment and basically improving roads, building, um, putting in infrastructure that supports a project. But the way the Ohio legislation is written and the codes are, it also expands, Ohio expands the definition of kind of public benefit to include economic development, urban renewal, Things like that. So, okay, through the chair, who will um, uh, hold the title to this piece of property? Uh, to the councilman th uh, through the chair, um, Mr. Chair, the the title will be held by 3614 Euclid. The title has been transferred previously to the city and back to 3614 Euclid. That was the um, prior. The, the city uh, had made that approval uh, about. 
six weeks ago, and that transaction took place about four weeks ago, three weeks ago. So, so through the chair, who is 3614 Euclid? Who is that? Oh, who that is, oh, no, um, that, uh, sorry, to the chair, um, uh, to the uh, council member, that is um, the uh, developer's legal entity that they acquired the property with. It's Crimson Capital owns 3614 Euclid, and Crimson <laughs> Capital is owned by my uh, Dianos Rodriguez, who had previously appeared here. And is uh, and and, uh, and and then there are some minority shareholders. Okay, through the chair, the Marriott brand that you um, re referred to. What what will the role of the Marriott brand? Uh, what, explain the role of the Marriott brand uh, in this project. Uh, uh, to the to the council member through the chair, uh, thirty six fourteen Euclid. Um, it is essentially franchising or licensing the name Delta by Marriott and has a, a, a licensing agreement whereby they can operate a Delta hotel. So Marriott doesn't own all of their hotels. They license a, a large number of them. This is one of them that they would be licensing. And so the developer, you know, 3614 Euclid, would be required to operate it up to Marriott standards and pursuant to all of Marriott's rules. So if I could, real quick, just to make it simple, let's just use two corporate brand names like a Starbucks or McDonald's. Most of them are not owned when you look at them by Starbucks or McDonald's. Most of them will have a LLC or something that they operate under, but then they actually have to operate under the brand structure or the brand name of those. Uh, to the chair, I'll, um, typically when you do development, um, developers, because of liability and because you have complicated ownership structures where every deal may have a different group of owners, every development you see is going to be a standalone right. entity, so it has an LLC. So a limited liability yeah, corporation. Limited li well, so and basically, you know, um, profits get passed through the LLC to the members. However, you know. Liability is limited, <laughs> so that's kind so of so basically the they create that yeah. so that so they so that the corporate people can um, avoid some of the risks that are that come with um, to the chair. It's, it's a risk management tool, and it's also it allows you to keep separate to create um, to to have various different ownership structures where I could develop a property and only have 5% ownership in one deal. I could have maybe 30% ownership in another deal because, and it's just different people come to the tables for different situations. They're all, every development is like its own separate business, just typically like some, some franchises. They're their own separate business. Councilman Bishop. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any benefits agreements with this deal that's attached to this deal? Um, through the chair to the council member, there is no formal signed community benefits agreement because um, this basically came to the table before we started having conversations around that and before um, I started issuing letters of understanding and DMs that require them for negotiating for all projects. However, this developer has taken it upon themselves to meet with a councilwoman and members of the community to actually start to, to negotiate and to agree to those things just, you know, on their own. So. So there's no, to, to answer your question, no. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councilman Bishop, that's a great question because today one of the things you're going to hear is a resolution 954-2022. <laughs> that is a resolution really um, uh, having council put forth a committee to actually attach community benefits agreements to all of these kind of deals. Uh, so that's something that uh, Director Jackson and a group of us have already been working on with uh, Councilwoman Santana and Councilman Harrison to be able to attach those as part of the legislative record um, and make it more formal whenever we do those. So that's a step that council is actually making a step towards today. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Councilwoman Santana. Oh. I totally forgot I even asked you about this, but um, first of all, through the chair, I just want to congratulate Councilwoman House. This is a wonderful project. So I was just reading a little bit about the developer. So he's not from here. He's from New York, from New York. And so it's very rare that I cross um, and I, I see a Latino developer. Just, I'm just curious to know a little bit about his background. And does he have any other investment in the city of Cleveland? Uh uh, to, uh, to the councilwoman front through the chair, uh, this is uh, Dionis's uh, first investment in Cleveland for his group. Um, he uh, 
he has a lot of experience in the hotel business. He had been in a consultant and, and, and a um, managing director at, uh, I believe it was managing director at H, um, H uh, Hospitality Venture Capital, uh, a hospitality investment firm, and he branched off on his own several years ago. Uh, he's done a lot of philanthropic work as well, and then he has a partner who's based in, he, Dionis is based in New York, although he actually lives in New Jersey, and he's got a partner who lives in, uh, in the Atlanta area who um, has a lot of hotel management work, Amin Alidana. Uh, they are very interested in, in working in the community. Um, and, and it's one of the things that's really important to Dionis is that he, um, uh, and it's something that he's emphasized throughout his career and his volunteer work um, is being engaged in, in community activities. But this is his first Ohio investment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, uh, ordinance number seven, 72-2022 stands approved. Please sign on. Congratulations to uh, Councilwoman Housing. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. All right, thank you. The next is uh, ordinance number 762-2022 by Council Members Harrison and Griffin by Departmental Request and Emergency Ordinance authorizing the Director of Economic Development to enter into a grant agreement with the Greater Cleveland Media Development Corporation, DBA Greater Cleveland Film Commission, or its de designee, to assist with general operating expenses of the organization, Director and Mr. Garvey. To the chair, I'm going to pass the mic to <laughs> Mr. Garvey. Welcome, Bill. How are you today? Good, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Please proceed. So uh, thank you for, for uh, taking the time to uh, see me today. Uh, so uh, the Greater Cleveland Film Commission, we focus on three uh, pillars. Our, our mission uh, focuses on education, advocacy, and uh, uh, attraction. Um, so. Uh, just to briefly touch on the ed education portion of what we do, obviously when we bring films to Cleveland to spend money and hire, we want them to hire local. And producers want to hire local too because it saves them money. To that end, we actually have to teach these skills. These aren't just uh, innate skills. So we partner with CMSD uh, on a program to teach every aspect of the film business and all the hundreds of jobs and careers that people can choose locally to stay here and work here in Ohio. So when we look at brain drain, this is one very sexy way to combat that. Um, and we also partner with the local film schools uh, university-wise uh, with you know, Tri-C, with Cleveland State, with CIA, with Kent State to keep the pipeline of kids coming out of those schools, stay local, work local. Um, internship programs, networking mixers, all of this in the effort to create a community to build a, a stronger, uh, more robust community that works on these projects when they come. Advocacy, uh, we advocate for the tax incentive structure that creates the economic environment that drives business to Ohio. Last year we had uh, between 160 and 170 million dollars spent in the state of Ohio because of the film business direct spending on production. Uh, but at the same time, we had 224.5 million dollars of production budget apply to the state of Ohio for the tax incentive and be turned away due to our 40 million dollar cap. So we advocate for a restructuring of our tax incentive, statewide tax incentive, that will draw more of that business to keep all those jobs from leaving the state and going to places like Pittsburgh. We compete with them on the football field while we keep compete with them in the film business as well. Um, this year, uh, similar, similar. We, we had $309 million of applications come into the state. Uh, only 84.5 uh, million were granted uh, approval, which meant, uh, sorry, uh, only 200 uh, were granted approval, which meant that $165.2 million worth of production budget has gone away from Ohio. Um, and then attraction. So attraction is a big part of what we do. We can maintain relationships with the studios, with producers, uh, internationally, locally, and uh, from California and New York to draw business here. Uh, we are not the first state that comes to mind in the film business, so we have to keep in front of it. We have a hand on the pulse of what's in development. There's 4,000 projects in development at any one time. Most of them can actually be shot here. Uh, we're a chameleon. The benefit of this region is that we can look like any other city. We have topography that can look like any other uh, state. Uh, and because of that, uh, when filmmakers come here, they love it. 
So that's the three pillars, that's what we focus on, and uh, we've been pretty successful, but we can do more. We're leaving a lot of money on the table, and we look forward to the passage of SP 341, which uh, the City Council, thank you, has, uh, has uh, 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 you, you've uh, launched a proclamation in support of, so thank you for that support. Uh, so we hope to have uh, some positive progress on that by the end of the year. And just to reiterate, this council passed uh, SB 341 um, at the last council meeting, which actually asked the state to remove the cap altogether. Uh, because originally we were trying to increase the cap to about 120 million, and we still didn't think that was enough. And Bill, you know, and I spent a lot of weekends on the phone uh, talking about how much we're turning away um, as far as incentives um, for some of these movies, which I think is very critical. So I'd like for you, if you could, to keep keep us abreast of that uh, so that we can know how it's impacting us. A couple of things before we go any further. First of all, can we get that data sheet that you have and can uh, we give it to Kimberly or can you make sure that you have enough copies for every council member? Uh, because that is important for I think every council member to have. So we need 17 copies and if we could, we'll give them to Kimberly and then she'll make copies for all of us. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, probably enough for and then if you could, could you make sure that you send an electronic copy to uh, Ms. Tilly, who is our um, policy and research team, because I think that that's good data for council to have. Um, just want to make sure I can reiterate, 160 million was spent in Ohio, and 224 million was turned away. What year was that? Was that 20? That was in 2021. Okay, so in 2022, can you reiterate and give us the amount for 2022 again? Yeah, uh, 165.2 million was turned away. 165.2 was turned away. How much was actually brought in? 200, and I, I gave you my copy, so you have it in front okay, of you. 200, uh, 200 and something was uh, approved. 200 and something was approved. 224 was approved. And, okay. and that's due to a little bit of rollover. So we're capped at 40 million annually. Uh, there was rollover due to COVID, so that increased the amount of money available. So that's why you have a higher number approved this year. Mr. Garvey, could you explain what it means about the cap? I understand that, but I think it's important for the listening public as well as um, the council to understand what it means with the cap because that was critical on why a couple of uh, very diverse First movie producers were turned away. Can you explain that, sir? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, so there's two, two elements that work against us. Uh, the cap is one of them, but the application window is the one that you're referring to. So two years ago, uh, the state uh, restructured the tax incentive to institute uh, application windows that limit uh, when a movie can apply for tax incentive to two times a year. Uh, first time is uh, April 15th to June 1st. Second time is October 15th to December 1st. Uh, outside of those windows, no applications will be uh, received. So any job, any production that uh, reaches out to us to apply will be turned away and most often they, they go somewhere else. Uh, and that was the case that we worked on uh, a few months ago. So just for clarity, we actually lost, um, and I just have to tell everybody, we, we, they're still trying to pull it off, but there's a biopic regarding Bone Thugs and Harmony. Um, that we really, really believe that our hometown kids should be done here in the city of Cleveland. And because of that application window and because of the cap that the dollars were expended, there's a potential and possibility that that movie could not be done here in Cleveland, mm -hmm. that they were potentially going to move to Mississippi and do it. Um, because down in the bayou, <laughs> there was actually, um, they have uh, no cap. In, in Mississippi and in some of those other, or, or they have a cap, but it's it's. A um, lot I mean, they have frankly a, a lower cap than we do. So but they, they just were, have more wiggle room. Yeah, and they don't have application windows. So we're one of the few states that has application windows. The um, the application review process is 14 weeks long, which is a, another impediment. Uh, most states have a shorter uh, application mm -hmm. review process, um, but because we score applications against each other it takes longer to do that work. If you uncap the tax incentive, that removes that 
element of it and would speed up the process, make it more efficient to gain more of this production. And just so that everybody can tie this together, that's why we passed the resolution urging the state legislator to pass um, SB 341 uh, so that we can get more of those kind of movies here because Netflix and Hulu and a lot of those kind of uh, companies are doing a lot more movies and trying to come to markets like Cleveland in order to do that. Correct, Mr. Chair. And when you compare it to the leader in this business right now, Georgia, Georgia had $4.4 billion of direct spend last year. And that's not economic generating, that's literally just the direct expenditures by movie companies coming in and filming. 92,000 people work and live in Georgia in this business. And, and Mr. Garvey, what I would love for you to do one day, and I don't want to do it today, but it's good for council to really have sessions to understand that. So if maybe a couple of council members at a time can actually go over to the film commission and meet with you to better understand your industry, I think it would be great um, so that we can make sure that we advocate appropriately the way that we need to. I understand the economic impact as well as the morale that it does for the city of Cleveland, but it's very good for this council to really understand how it ties into Cleveland State University and really a job producer and an economic development tool as well. One last thing, this is the Committee of Economic um, Inclusion, Diversity and Equity and Inclusion. Out of that, uh, in uh, 2022, out of the uh, 165.2 that was turned away, do we measure and look at how many of those were African American or Hispanic or Latino or Asian American or do we know what share of the market um, that we actually are doing that, and do you or the state have the ability to make sure that there is inclusion, and how can this council present itself to make sure that there's diversity, equity, and inclusion in these investments? So there, there have been diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, programs instituted in the movie business so that um, each production that's now coming in has a program designed to uh, give opportunity to diverse candidates uh, in their paid internship program. So with Shooting Stars, the LeBron James biopic, uh, the Film Commission sourced all the resumes that went into that to support those jobs. Uh, same thing with the, uh, the movie that has just been uh, announced to film here, uh, Perfect Imprints, which that's the code name. It's a Marvel movie uh, this fall. Um, so, <laughs> okay. And just um, to Councilman Bishop's point earlier, um, in the future, we want to make sure that we track economic um, community benefits. And one of the community benefits that we got that nobody talks about is a completely redesigned South um, high gym yes. that actually is going to house the police headquarters. So there were a tremendous amount, a major investment. If anybody hasn't been over there in Ward 12 to see the amount of investments made in that building, um, that would have been on the city dime had we not had that community benefit. Um, I hope you're tracking those kind of things to make sure that we understand that as well. Yes, Mr. Chair. And just to um, talk, talk a little bit more about it. So South High was the, uh, the high school in Shooting Stars. They, they made that their stage. They spent a lot of money to uh, do some abatement work. I think there was some roof repairs made as well. Sure. And Bill, we usually do this every year with this $200,000 um, commitment. I would really just encourage, um, and, and once again, I'm in, I'm in favor of this, but I'd encourage that we make sure that we have a full community benefit understanding and make sure that we understand the economic um, diversity and expand and how you're working with local theaters like Caramu or... Um, um, Esperanza. Uh, Esperanza. On, on, uh, Archwood, the one uh, oh, we just, Julio de Burgos. Julio de Burgos, yeah, those kind of um, local diverse groups uh, in order to make sure that we attract talent and um, really get some of the young people involved in there. So I would really love if you can talk with uh, some of us and make sure that we have that, really understand the community benefit through that, okay? Understood. All right. Mr. Chair, just to briefly touch on our film skills program, uh, that is 91% right now at this moment, the class we're teaching, uh, diverse. Great. And it will also be good to make sure that everybody understands that you don't just have to be in front of the camera, that there's even more money behind the camera, um, behind the scenes. So really making sure that everybody understands that I don't think that people grasp how big this is for the city. And I really want to make sure that we really um, double down on that. Um, the only other thing that I really request is I got two beautiful young superstars that I want to <laughs> be on the next big show or movie that you have here, <laughs> Carrie McCormick and Jasmine Santana. So I'll be the producer producer, but put the uh, young talent in the, in the, in, on the screen if you could. Uh, I have Councilman Mike Polensic. They could be your new villains. You can put in a new <laughs> villain. Okay. Um, so um, my question is, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, to the um, 
to the director and to the representative of the Film Commission. Obviously, I support it. I supported it years ago when it came before us initially. I'm just trying to get an understanding. Is the, is the cap, is it, a, is it a statewide cap, or is it broken down by county? Mr. Chair, uh, to the councilman, um, it is a statewide cap. It's uh, divided up into two $20 million tranches every six months. And it, it's, uh, it's just, you could, t one project could come in and take it all if it's big enough. Uh, okay. But so far we haven't had projects big enough to do that. So but generally it's, you know, some, somewhere between, um, you know, almost in the hundreds of thousands to, you know, around 20 million right. is what each project takes. So the, um, and so the actual mechanics of the, of the cap itself, how, how does it work with, the, with I'm still not clear, how, how does the, the production company, how do, they, how do they take advantage of the cap? It's a 30% rebate on all in-state spending, uh, including payroll. So anything that happens in-state. So all the post-production that might happen in California does not apply, but anything, once they land on the ground, if they're staying at a hotel here, if they're buying their you know, food and uh, lumber for building sets, all that the vendor yeah. stuff, um, and, and for example, the last movie I directly worked on, we worked with 256 local vendors. So all that money counts. So that's a 30% rebate uh, given back at the end of the production after an audit. So they'll, they'll finish production, they'll go through an audit, it gets reviewed at the uh, Department of Economic Development, and then uh, that 30% is given back. Okay. So um, what I'm still not clear on, you're, you want the cap to be increased to what statewide? Well, we want it to be, so Georgia is uncapped. We want to be Georgia. We want to be a leader. We want billions of dollars coming here. Okay. We want to have that pipeline. Okay. Um, I was on the, the set, uh, I think it was for the Winter Soldier. I'm trying to think which one I was on. Uh, the Russo brothers that invited me to come in. Uh, as, as the director, as the president indicated, um, just the number of folks working on the set was incredible. I just, the electricians, the support staff, everybody, I was just, I, I, the, the caterers, I was just like, wow, you're watching them filming, but for everything you're seeing on film, it seemed there's 10 or 20 or 30 people behind that. Um, and it was just, it, it, it reinforced to me the, um, the impact, because I'm thinking, these people ought to stay somewhere. Mm -hmm. They all have to eat. The vehicles, the trucks, all the, the support mechanisms. So it was, it was very impressive. I've never seen anything like it before. Um, the, um, the other component here that has been ra it was raised in the past over the years um, was the fact that Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, does not have an, um, I guess the term is um, internal soundstage or in, internal uh, staging capacity. Where are we on that? Well, there are multiple developers that have, sorry, uh, through the chair to the councilman, uh, there are multiple developers that have expressed interest in building that or retrofitting existing warehouse space uh, to become stage space. Uh, it, it all is driven by a tax incentive ultimately though. So at the current uh, cap, at the $40 million cap, we, we get three, three quarters of a year of business. It's that extra three months where there's no business that becomes a problem for studios. So they wait because the cap is there. And when that cap gets uh, increased, they're ready to pounce. Um, so that, that's really the driving you know, mechanism that will lead to, to studios. Uh, so far, and, and I come out of production, I, I was working in this business for 26 years, the last 13 years here, and actually I was the location manager on Captain America, so I was one of those crew that you saw. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's driven by that tax incentive. That we, we make do with warehouse space as it is right now. It's not, it's not uh, exclusive for stage usage, but it works. And in the last production that I was on, uh, last year, uh, a Netflix movie, um, we took the old Severance Town Center Mall, Dead Mall, and used the, uh, the vacant Walmart as our stage at 70,000 square feet, and that, that worked out pretty well. So it can be done, and I, and I mentioned it last, uh, last week when I was testifying, 
you know, in New York and uh, LA and all these other places where it's a, a film business that's uh, entrenched, um, you know, it's not all scratch built st studios. We right. actually do retrofit uh, warehouse space quite a bit for this work. So about 70,000 square feet is what you need then, huh? It, temp it depends on the job. Uh, so that movie was giant, and, and to compare it to Captain America, which was a giant movie, that movie spent three times as much in, in Northeast uh, Ohio. Uh, but we weren't shutting down downtown, so nobody knew we existed. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it could be you know, a day, two months. Uh, that, that movie was there for six months. It was in that stage for six months, but some movies don't need that much, so they'll, they'll okay. maybe build a set and, and film for a day. Okay, so uh, that, that whole issue is still up in here trying to find a suitable location and for somebody to um, economically support that, i.e. the county or the city or a state. Right. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I support the action. Um, again, I saw firsthand the importance of this, what it meant to our city. I know some of my West Side uh, friends weren't too happy with the shoreway being shut down for a period of time, but nonetheless, there was a great deal of money who came in. A great deal of money came into the city of Cleveland, and I saw it firsthand, so I wholeheartedly support this. Thank you so much, Councilman Palencic. And just as a follow-up, because um, I want to make sure, um, it's always been my understanding that these big um, sound stages that are needed need to be soundproofed and need to be in places that are not close to rail lines, need to make sure that they have a lot of open space mm -hmm. and other things like that. So it would be great to make sure that we understand as council people and as administration to understand if there are areas that we should be really looking at for these kind of opportunities because it's my understanding, knowing the Russos, brothers who are proud, Ward 6, um, born and raised, and uh, actually still are very active in the neighborhood that they would love to build a sound stage here, as well as some minority developers like Marquette Williams and others that would really love to build um, these kind of stages. So if there are zoning issues or things that we should be aware of, I really encourage you to let us know through Director Wong, who's here as well, um, in order to make sure that we can start to identify those areas uh, for potential opportunities. Because I'm thinking right offhand, the Richmond Brothers building. Mm -hmm on 55th, that is a big building that can probably have a reuse, that can be a great uh, sound stage that is in a very good area of the city, even though I can't speak for Councilwoman House, but those are kind of opportunities that I think we should really look at. Mr. Chair, yeah, the, the key to any stage space is clear span height, so higher ceilings than normal. So typically 25 foot or higher. To what the is that, say that again? 25 feet or higher to the bottom of the truss. Because even if we build a one floor set, you still need to put a lighting grid above that. So that can, requires a considerable amount of space. And then also column spacing is a big deal. So wide column spacing or no column spacing. So that's why uh, Walmart in Severance Town Center worked so well because there was very little columns. Uh, as well as uh, parking. So it, it's like moving an army uh, in and out of all these locations. So on, on that last job that came here, there was 40 65 foot tractor trailers as a part of the company and 200 people on the crew. Awesome. So it takes a lot of space. Thank you. I have Councilwoman Jenny Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Council President. Just a comment um, to you because I think you know that I'm really proud to represent Cleveland City Council in Leadership Cleveland's class this year, which has been a great experience. And I wanted to share that Mr. Garvey is part of that class with me and I'm appreciating getting to know him. I um, think he's doing extraordinary advocacy uh, for this industry in Cleveland. And so I'm looking forward to supporting this and um, feeling very optimistic about the future of film production in Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, yes. To the entire council, um, or everyone present um, through the chair, I just want to say that the minute the film cap gets eliminated, uh, my office will be reaching out to Mr. Garvey to discuss basically how do we start identifying properties, how do we start creating business opportunities, because I've seen in New Orleans how building up your film industry creates all these amazing opportunities for caterers, for people who have transportation, people, costumers, um, and how do we just do development around Soundstage so we basically kind to, kind of um, create more of a permanent industry here because most of the film work that happens in Ohio happens in Cleveland. So I want that, I would want that to continue if, if when the film cap is removed, so. 
Totally concur, and as I was just sitting here with uh, Councilwoman Santana, we want to understand the industry. Grips, lighting, um, pages, all of the different behind the camera opportunities, and also want to make sure that we have local hiring. Uh, because a lot of times these companies do import people in from outside of the area because we don't have the talent acquisition that we need to in order to make sure that we fill these positions. So it's important that maybe at some point in time that uh, we have a session with workforce education and training in order to try to see how we can get a good group of people certified in that area uh, so that we can help grow the industry. So if we can have a follow up with that because we got to start putting ourselves to be shovel ready because these things are going to happen and we don't want to spend five years ramping up when they do happen. Um, Mr. Chairman, one thing you'll see is that um, as the industry ex expands in Cleveland, it will get to a point where you're going to have the companies, they're not going to be shipping people in, they're going to be permanently based. People are going to, people are going to, you know, people who aren't from here are going to move here. People who are here are going to get cr opportunities, they're going to create businesses around it. So I guarantee you it is going to be local hiring because the people who aren't local are going to want to become local. So. <laughs> Sounds good. One last thing, and then I'll um, close out, is um, how do we make sure, because, and I'm just, I may be muddling through this, but I, um, I've kind of learned a little bit about this this last year. How do we make sure we don't have conflict of interest? Because I know that the Film Commission also does site, um, site they try to identify site locations throughout the city uh, whenever these things happen and we want to make sure that we avoid conflicts of interest that you know we don't actually approve the cap or recommend the cap but also are responsible for site location and I may be a little off in what I'm saying but I think you get my drift on I think you guys kind of offer both am I correct that's, that goes to our, uh, Mr. Chair, that goes to our attraction effort. So in order to attract movies, we have to be the advocate for Cleveland and for Northeast Ohio. And that's the way we do it. We scout locations, we put together location packages to send, it's, it's an advertisement for Cleveland, to send to producers, to send to studios, to get them interested in coming here. Uh, without those pictures, without that scouting, the, the interest doesn't come. Right, and I get that, but I just want to make sure, how do we make sure we avoid any conflicts of interest when you're doing the scouting and also, because you don't approve the cap, that is done by the department, the state, right? Correct. So that's the separation, that you maybe make a recommendation um, for a movie, Netflix, Hulu, a major motion picture, et cetera, but you are not responsible for the site location and also approving the money or the funding, right? Correct, uh, Mr. Chair. And also, you know, what our initial work is to attract the movie with interest to come here, it doesn't, we don't carry through to the entire project. So then at that point when they say, okay, now we're looking at Cleveland, now we're looking at Northeast Ohio, then they hire a location manager, and that's the job that I used to do uh, to carry on that work. So ultimately, we, we don't get involved in the movie itself. It's just an attraction element of it, of, of That's the great. initial mission to get them interested in Cleveland. That's great. And, and I would like to work closely with Chairman Harrison and uh, Councilwoman Santana to really convene some of these uh, minority, African-American, female, Hispanic, Latina, um, you know, Asian-American filmmakers so that we could really make sure that they understand and you understand their challenges so that we could really uh, get ahead of the curve and make sure that we have diversity, equity, and inclusion and make sure that we have a robust industry because I believe that uh, the movies are coming our way and we need to be prepared. But Bill, you've been doing a great job. Thank you so much. And I don't see any other questions. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 762-2022 uh, stands approved. Thank you, Director. This is a great job. Great thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Ordinance number 762-2022 stands approved. Thank you. Okay. All right, the next one is ordinance number 818-2022 as amended by council members House, Harrison and Griffin by departmental request, an emergency ordinance approving the addition of property located at 5000 Euclid Avenue to the Northeast Ohio Advanced Energy District, accepting and approving a petition and plan from a property owner in the district, identifying a special energy improvement project, declaring it necessary to conduct the special energy improvement project, 
providing for the assessment of the cost of such special energy improvement project, authorizing the Director of Economic Development to enter into an energy project cooperative agreement and a special assessment agreement to implement the project and declaring an emergency. This is pretty much uh, the pace at the Agora, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman. OK. So, Director, you want to introduce your guests? Um, good, good afternoon again to the council uh, through the chair. This is um, Sean Neese. He is one of the developers for the project. And he's here to answer any questions you have about the project. I just want to say, remind everyone that this PACE is really just kind of a pass-through structure. There's really no cost to the city. So it's just approving our role in the PACE process. So, And Director, just briefly, you don't have to get into it, because I know that I actually had one of the first PACE projects over at 11802 Shaker Boulevard. Could you just give a brief snapshot so that everybody understands what the PACE project means and why it's so critical? Mr. Chairman, what's the number again? This is 818-2022. Please proceed. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, then a PACE, PACE is essentially it is a mechanism for financing energy efficiency um, projects where instead of the developer or in the case if you're doing residential pace, you go out and you put your, put your own equity, your own money up, or you borrow money um, directly for the project and have, finance it through either um, first or second mortgage or you include it in your construction financing with pace, in this case commercial pace, what you're doing is you're you're putting together your project plan, you're figuring out what your cost benefit analysis is, what your return on investment is, and you go out and you figure out what it's gonna cost you, and you, get, you submit an application to um, uh, energy, um, advanced energy district, I forget the name of the district, so please forgive me, and they approve including your project in the special district, which is unlike a physical district, it's kind of a, a collection of PACE projects. And that district is like a taxing district in, in effect where you would then basically add your PACE a tax, a tax assessment, you can look at it like that way, into your regular property taxes and that assessment essentially pays down the loan for the project. So it's just using your tax bill to pay for your energy efficiency project improvements. So basically it's a triple bottom line impact, social, economic, and environmental impact that helps in all three areas it's and a, really it, helps our community. It, 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 it's a innovative way to, to, to provide financing for energy efficiency projects. Awesome. Did you want to introduce your guest? Yes, this is Sean Neese. He is one of the developers for um, the Agora for the project, and he's here to answer any questions. Like I said before, it's a great project. There's no cost to the city in supporting this PACE um, legislation, so. Thank you. Did you want to make any comments? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, to uh, the members of this committee through the chair. Yes. Uh, the, this is uh, for the Agora. Uh, we, are, uh, we are converting it. Uh, it's an adaptive reuse project. We have brought both federal tax credits and state tax credits into the project. And it will be both multifamily housing as addition, in addition to offices, a restaurant space, and we're proud to be uh, the home of the Midtown Cleveland CDC. Uh, so they have been in our building prior to our ownership and we just renewed our agreement with them uh, to give them their free house for the next so many years. So that is one of the community developments, uh, community benefits that we are bringing on this project. This is awesome. Uh, this is the old Agora building, right? Yes, sir, Chair. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Hold up, we had a question. Okay, all right, uh, Councilman uh, Polinsic, and then uh, Councilman Casey. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable colleagues, I am, um, I'm, I'm kind of confused on this one. So um, whoever can answer. So this is a, a form of financing for a development project. I'm, I'm still not clear on how this works. Yeah. Um, through the chair to the council member, 
case is, it's a mechanism where you, it's a way of paying for the financing as opposed to paying a monthly, a monthly note um, I mean, on a loan for your energy efficiency financing or including in your construction financing, your permanent financing. It's a separate financing vehicle that where you become a part of a special t um, assessment district and that assessment gets tacked on to your property tax bill. So when you pay your annual property taxes, you pay your PACE assessment and that is how you pay down the financing for, or the loan, if you want to say it, for the energy efficiency um, project. The difference with PACE and a mortgage is if I, if I buy a house or I develop a piece of property, if I sell that property, I have to pay off the, the mortgage and the loan. With PACE, the assessment stays with the property. And this can be utilized citywide, this concept? It can, you can do a PACE project anywhere in the city. Does it have to be in a bid? No. No. So, Councilman, when you create the district, that's pretty much what we're voting on. You actually, we would have to, as a council, vote on a district. So, for example, the first time we voted on this was approximately about four years ago for a building that we had on Shaker Boulevard. And this is actually, you, you kind of vote for a special district. And in essence, this is what some developers use in order to make their buildings more environmentally okay. sound, safe, and everything else. So it's a, it's a financing tool that we have to approve to basically allow a district to be created so that a developer can use these mechanisms to pay for those. So sales. do the property owners have to agree to that within that district, or we just, the city finds the district? Um, Director. Through the chair to the council member, each project is its kind of standalone assessment within this larger district, and so, no one else except for the um, the the board that oversees the larger the the special assessment district, which I apologize, it's escape the name is escaping me, but it includes um, city of Cleveland and the surrounding immediate um, municipalities. They vote to admit a project or a site to the district and each project or site within that district has its own assessment that gets attacked that gets attached to its tax bill. And the name of that board, just to give you the example, is the Northeast Ohio Advanced Energy District. Um, so that is a district, and they're the ones that, once you approve this, this piece of legislation, then they will become a part of that group, and that's who will actually approve and, this. And that's who it. sets up that group, Mr. Chairman? The, um, the, the, to the chair through, um, to the council member through chair, it is actually established by state um, legislation. So okay. it's, it's, a state, it's a state approved entity. Okay, so there, it does, you don't have to be in a bid, a business in, in uh, okay, uh, special assessment district, or SID, excuse me, SID. Um, and so it, it's pertaining to specific property. Through the chair, um, to the council member through the chair, it actually is an assessment. So each, yes. each let's say each property that's a mem member of this district that's included in this umbrella district. Oh has its own assessment that is attached that basically okay. finances its project. I won't belabor the point, but if you could supply, provide us, the members of council, uh, in layman's terms, how this would work for other projects or other potential developments. Through the chair to the council member. I, actually, I have a couple of other paces that are coming through. Yeah. It's essentially developers decide they want to do energy efficiency pro improvements yes. and they don't want to put it in, they don't want to finance it through their construction financing or using their equity. So okay. they apply for a, a special pace assessment and that becomes, I guess, a part of their capital stack. I'm just trying to better understand it. So, so if there was a, a development or a project so in each of our wards, how, how do we plug somebody into this? How Director, if we could, because this would be helpful. Um, Ms. Tilly, can we work, or Mr. Titran, can we work with uh, Director um, Jackson? Because I believe there's at least three that I know about. 
um, and identify what those three are so that Councilman Polinsic and this council can actually have hard examples. So the one that I know was the Shaker Professional Building at 11802 Shaker Boulevard. So then you could actually have an example of what they actually do. So there's about three that I know about. Oh. Um, uh, to the chair. If it would be helpful, uh, I will ask Mr. Neese to kind of sh uh, share with uh, me and I will share with you the actual initial proposal, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so you can see what that proposal looks like and essentially see kind of what is projected, you know, what the financing would look like. Sure, and, and I think the reason that that's helpful is because I, I'm looking at the interests of the members around the table, and I think that a lot of members would like to encourage some of the businesses that they're doing yeah. to take advantage of this, because I know that I do. Um, so I think it's important to really help them understand that and really have a hard example. So if Mr. Neese is willing to do that, I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. so. um, and to the chair, uh, I can also try to reach out to some of the consultants that work on these projects. I think that's probably the great the best starting point where they could come in and actually a lot of the times the local utilities I can I'll ask someone at or try to reach out to someone at Cleveland Public Power to see if they have a program where they promote this or they just promote energy efficiency and discuss payment options because I said some people pay for it out of pocket some people do a base so it's really how you want to pay for it and I think so Mr. Chairman because I'm just looking at I'm, I'm guess I'm, I'm classifying this as another form of creative financing and Definitely. so all of us need to be aware of, of other forms of creative financing to make a project work or to be uh, to, to enhance it more. Okay, so whatever you can provide to us, I certainly would appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, through the um, to the council member through the chair, I think one of the big advantages of PACE is it really is a good tool for stand. I mean, for um, post rehab, post improvements, where Going to a bank, you know, if you've got maybe a thirty, forty thousand dollar project, the bank doesn't really want to loan you that. In the case of residential, you maybe need to do ten thousand worth of energy efficiency improvements, and the bank's looking at you like, "We'll give you a credit card." <laughs> but Pace winds up being an affordable tool for people, and so that's kind of the big, um, the big advantage. Thank you. Thank you. And just for your records, I did just send something that kind of gives a layman's term of what it is. So just take a look whenever you guys get a chance, okay? All right. Um, I did have Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Neese, nice, thank you very much for coming back to the table again. And unlike other big projects or developers in the, around the city, you're actually a customer of Cleveland Public Power, correct? I am a customer of Cleveland Public Power on more than one project. And, and this project is being powered by Cleveland Public Power? This project is being powered by Cleveland Public Power. It is in the tower now, and it will remain. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Councilman Casey, for always drumming up customers for CPP. <laughs> uh, uh, seeing uh, no other questions, I do have to read these amendments. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm safe. Um, that's why I asked the attorney that I need to read the amendments. And uh, even though I read as amended earlier, and it's one in section one, line two, strike 818-2022-A and insert 818-2022-B. Number two, in section three, line two, strike 4,754,701.92 and insert $4,728,305.68. Can those amendments please be added for the record? Thank you. Seeing no other questions, this uh, ordinance 818-2022 stands approved. Thank you so much, sir. Nice blazer, too, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the rest of council. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Director. OK. Um, I do see that I have a couple of uh, community development and also uh, city planning pieces. We have court. We have court. Where is court? Port. I'm sorry. Port. OK. I'll get port in one second. Uh, director, uh, 
What's director? What's your name? Director. Kramer. Kramer. Yep. Okay. Port. Out here, Port, and then um, I'll come back to CD. Okay. Okay. So, um, Director Kramer, thank you. Welcome. Well. All right. And let me make sure that I have this right. This is ordinance number. What number you got, Director? Seven seven. 770. 770? Yes. Okay. All right. Ordinance number 770-2022 by Council Members McCormick and Griffin by Departmental Request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the purchase of rental by one or more requirement contracts of the purchase of new rental, of new heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and the necessary items of labor, equipment, and materials necessary to maintain, repair, test, inspect, or enhance existing systems for the Division of Airports, Department of Port Control, for a term of two years with two one-year options to renew, the first of which shall require additional legislative authority. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Port Control is seeking uh, approval uh, to acquire a, a new contract uh, out for our airports, uh, Hopkins, Burke, um, to, uh, for our HVAC systems, our chillers, our boilers, um, all types of uh, HVAC systems. We have pretty extensive systems out at the airport. Uh, this is a, a contract uh, to assure that all those systems are properly uh, maintained and repaired if necessary. Uh, we do have a lot of aging uh, pieces and uh, aging infrastructure that uh, does need some pretty regular maintenance. And uh, for, for this contract would be to uh, repair, replace, maintain all of our different systems at the airports. Um, for this, uh, we seek your approval to uh, go out for a contract. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Councilman McCormick, this was heard in uh, Port Control uh, Mobility, Transportation and Mobility. Mr. Chairman, um, I was on the same call you were that day, so Vice Chair Slife heard this piece. If I could uh, yield to him. Vice Thank Chair Slife. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, this was heard by Transportation Mobility and, and passed last week uh, without any objections. As, as the executive summary states, uh, much at the airport is, is old, which underscores uh, all the master planning work, the value of all the master planning work that's ongoing. Thank all you. right. Thank you. Do I have, see no other questions? Ordinance number 770-2022 stands approved. Thank you, Director. Thank you. All right. Uh, Director Hernandez, I'm trying to get to you. Are you at 612-2022? Or Director Hernandez in green? 883. 883? Okay, so 612-2022 is, uh, that's the Casey Amendment, right? <laughs> come, on up. come on up, Director Hernandez. Okay. Yeah. Okay, come on up, uh, Director. I'll do Director Hernandez, then Director Martin. All right, because I can cha-cha, we can. <laughs> you're good, you're good, you're good. Okay. All right, so this is ordinance number 883-2022 as amended by Council Members Harrison and Griffin by departmental request, an emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Community Development to enter into a loan agreement with Woody O. Homes to LLC or its designee to finance the development of Woodhill Center East affordable housing at 11305 Woodland Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, 44104. Director? All right, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this, uh, this Woodhill Choice Project is uh, something that should be very familiar to you all at this table. Um, this is a part of an ARPA request um, this is uh, a $5 million request um, for, uh, out of the housing gap financing. Um, the reason we are bringing this outside of that typical ARPA structure is that we have timelines that um, the developer team needs to, uh, needs to adhere to, and we don't want to hold them up. We know that this is a worthy project. We've um, had support for this project. Um, and uh, we want to be able to see this through. Um, with me today, I have Commissioner Green. Um, uh, during DPNS, we had, uh, we had Tony Bango, but he is out on paternity leave. Uh, he and his wife just welcomed a baby girl. Oh, okay. um, so uh, any questions, um, Commissioner Green and I should be able to answer for you today. Um, Commissioner Green, you want to give us uh, a summary of 
what we're asking for today. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, the uh, project is uh, the second phase of a six-phase uh, Woodhill Choice um, uh, development through um, through the uh, Choice Grant uh, from HUD. It's a 77-unit uh, project, which comprises uh, a multi-unit building of 51 units and 16 townhomes. Uh, the 70 of the 77 units we're using. Um, uh, there, there will be 24 home assisted units, and uh, we're contributing then $4,919,291 uh, to that. Uh, you're looking at. Could you uh, repeat that? $4,919,000. Gotcha. $919,291. Got it. Okay, and there will be 60% um, uh, AMI. Um, may likely lean more towards 50, but uh, we're targeting at max 60% AMI. All right, so um, just want to make sure that we're clear, and I do want to read the amendment before um, we move further, even though I did that. And I did have a question on why we needed this amendment, um, and I don't know if you or the legal team can explain why, but it says, insert the following new whereas clause before the last existing whereas clause, whereas the city has prepared a written justification in accordance with the guidance for capital expenditures and the written justification is approved and. Why did we need to add that written justification? I, I believe I understand, but can anybody give me a clarification? To, to the chair, and if the director has anything to add to this, uh, in order to expend ARPA funds, there is a requirement of a written justification. So unlike when we expend uh, CDBG or home funds, general uh, HUD home funds, uh, where we can just uh, use our uh, apply and expend ordinance, uh, each expenditure requires a justification. I believe that justification is over $50,000. Okay. So, just so I can make sure that I understand, because this is important for council to understand. This is in Woodhill, so I don't want anybody to think that we're doing it um, just in Ward 6. I'm seeing Casey look over my shoulder. You know, he catches everything. But um, bottom line is, this is Woodhill. The reason that you needed to do this is because it was time sensitive to fall in line with the financial stack that is needed for the second phase of the Woodhill Choice um, project that is going right there at uh, 113 something Woodland. And what this would be, this is the answer Councilman Polensic's earlier questions. This fund will be drawn out of those gap funds that we will approve um, once we go through that pot of money for 35 million of gap financing. So this specific project can be utilized with a portion of those funds. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So that's why every, I want everybody to understand. But the reason that we moved earlier on this, as opposed to waiting until that was passed, and I talked to Chairman Hairston about this, because I really, at first, was going to hold it and not do it because I didn't want people thinking that we were doing it before we passed that fund, mm -hmm. is because this was and is time sensitive to okay. comply with what we're trying to do with the federal government stack. Am I correct? Yes. Um, Chairman, you are correct. And, and actually, the original legislation was drafted in March. Right. So that, that we, and I, we have been holding and I held for, it for a while. Because I did not want to move until we got closer to putting that gap yes. together. So just so everybody can understand that, um, that's part of that whole portion. And uh, as Councilwoman Spencer said earlier, if we just deem later that we think we need to expand that, then that's something we can do. But I want everybody to understand why we moved on this and why this was important. I got Councilman McCormick, and then I have uh, Councilman Polinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just speaking today, and one of the questions I asked director at our committee hearing was, how does this fit into the greater ARPA? So she explained as you just did, uh, which is really helpful. Obviously, at the end of the day, um, I'm a big fan of creating these larger policy pots of money, um, but then, of course, they have to be deployed. They don't, they don't sit there to look good. For us to you know, take a look at them on a shelf all day, they've got to be deployed in our community. Um, Mr. Chair, this, this uh, project um, is um, far from Ward 3. 
Um, but again, as you noted earlier, um, what's good for the city is good for Ward 3 and 6 and, and all of that on and on and on. So uh, I think this is one of, I've stated this before, Mr. Chairman, uh, over the past couple of years, this um, revitalization of Wood Hill is so important for the city of Cleveland. I mean, really, uh, I know you've been an integral part as the Ward 6 council member, but it's really beyond Ward 6. This is a, a huge project for the city. Um, really, really important project for the city. So excited to see that um, this pot of dollars that we uh, earmarked uh, as a city for this type of activity is going into a viable project that's supported by federal dollars and otherwise um, to really provide really high quality housing for folks. So uh, again, Mr. President, um, an example I just wanna highlight as we've had this discussion, this is not Ward 3, but I believe fundamentally, as you noted, that it benefits the whole city and it benefits my residents like it benefits anybody else because we're lifting up the whole city with these types of projects. And once again, a project that um, has had a coalition for how, a lot of years. Several years. Many years. Um, <laughs> and it's also leveraging federal dollars. So to me, this is a great project that leverages other sources of funding. We'll have large scale community impact and get to one of those major policy goals that we outlined in our ARPA process. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman McCormick. Councilman Polensic, then Councilman Casey. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, to the director. Um, so when I, I'm just trying to understand something, looking at the um, what's been presented to us. So this is for the second phase. There's a total of six phases. So Am I to understand then that, that there will be additional substantial amounts of money on the remaining phases as well from the city? Will those be ARPA funds? Um, so through the chair, um, we have not, uh, they would be eligible for those funds, okay. but as far as a commitment of those funds, um, we, we don't have that. We have not committed anything additional. Um, they would go into a pool to be competitive um, for, for any subsequent funds. Okay. So this is just for the second phase of the, uh, and there's a total of six phases. Correct. Correct? Okay. And so um, I guess, you know, I'll leave it for another day in discussion. I, this, this whole ongoing, I guess, growing debate as to uh, our support to, re to build or rebuild existing housing estates versus the construction of new single family homes in our neighborhoods. It's, it's, a, it's becoming a concern of mine. When I look at the amount of money we're spending on uh, multifamily units or rebuilding existing projects versus um, building new housing in our neighborhood for families to live in with, with yards for kids. So it's, it, to me, it's gonna be a, a growing discussion, hopefully around this table. Um, and I hope we can get some clarification and some resolution. I just don't know if we should continue to be building multifamily complexes with all the vacant lots that we have in this city versus building new housing for families. It's, it's something that I'm, I'm greatly concerned about. So I'll, I'll just throw that on the table. Thank you. Thank you. And Director, just if I can make sure that I think, once again, I think this is a growing process with council, and I would really encourage you and maybe Mr. Green to kind of help council through Chairman Harrison understand the new model with HUD, because the new model with HUD is not building multi-unit apartment complexes in brick cities as you've seen in the past. The new, the new way of trying to do it is to try to have mixed income and these areas are not how you built them where you actually had centralized poverty and concentrated poverty. These are actually to try to have mixed income and deconcentrate poverty. And actually, if you look at this strategy, it actually does promote exactly what you're saying, which is why Habitat and other mm -hmm. things like Councilman Casey is trying to do is so important because it's to try to promote home ownership and try to decentralize and deconcentrate those sales of poverty that we've seen that have strangled this city uh, for far too long. And next up is probably going to be where my good friend Councilman McCormick has in Lakeview Terrace because this is the new um, plan of what HUD and 
some of these other areas are trying to do. So I think it would be good at some point in time to really help council understand the new philosophy so that everybody can understand that we're trying to do exactly what Councilman Polensic is saying and not build these cells of poverty like it used to be. Okay. Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the director, just as I've asked before, uh, would you happen to know who Woodhill Homes is using as an electric supplier? You got me again. <laughs> I will. I will find. I will find. Okay, out. so find out. to director, because you're director of community development, mm -hmm. and to uh, the administration in whole and in general, right? To all the chiefs and directors and whatever else titles over there. When any project that's going to come before the table, whether they're asking for a TIF, a grant, a loan, a street closure, whatever, uh, from this point forward, I'm going to ask that question throughout the remainder of my term in office, right? I want to know who the electric supplier is and if the city's offering anything um, as an incentive for any of these buildings, I want to know who the electric supplier is for that project. So I didn't think you would know today you weren't, you didn't see that coming. But from this point going forward, uh, any, we would like to know that information. Thank you, Mr. And, Chairman. And uh, through the chair uh, to the councilman, uh, just as an FYI, and I can get your answer today for you, yeah. but um, going back to when we uh, uh, attempted central choice, um, we used CPP then, and that was to, to in the infrastructure, we had uh, an infrastructure piece and a lighting piece, and we worked with CPP then. The, uh, this particular uh, phase is not right on Woodhill Homes Estate, it's uh, close to it between 110th and 116th MLK on Woodland and Mount Carmel. Uh, but I can find out the answer for the actual estates and what this particular site is using as well. All right, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But Commissioner is still the same. I think that his point is still, even though it is not on directly Woodhill Estates and where it is presently, is there an opportunity? So let me expand on his question. Is there an opportunity um, for this to be a CPP customer? Um, because I know this because I know people think I live on Larchmere, but my gas bill says Woodland. Uh, so I live right down the street from this, as you do, my neighbor. Um, so actually, um, you know, his question, I think, is still the same, is can this potentially be a CPP customer? And to the chair, I completely agree. Um, the um, yeah, CPP would be um, uh, preferable there, and I think we can we can find that out. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Seeing no other questions, and uh, once again, I did hold this a long time because I didn't want to hear any of my colleagues saying you're trying to rush this along. Uh, but hearing no other uh, questions, ordinance number 883-2022 stands approved. Thank you so much. Please sign on and thank all my colleagues for your support. Uh, thank you, Director. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner. Uh, next we have, where is, uh, I thought I seen That's Director Wong. Did she leave? Director Martin's here. Okay, Director Martin, you are up. You have 612, Director Martin? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So All right, so this is ordinance number 612-2022 as, as amended by Council Members Harrison and Griffin by Departmental Request and Emergency Ordinance to amend sections 363.12. 367.04, 367.05, and 3103.09 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, as amended by various ordinances relating to notices of violations. And before I move further, I am going to read the amendment. And the amendment is there is no legal objection to this legislation if amended as followed. In section one, line four, strike 367.04 and insert 367.05. Number two, in section one, add amended section 367.04B. Line one, strike by anyone and insert by one or more. 
Number three in section one at amended section 3103.09E3, line two, strike by anyone and insert by one or more. Number four in section two, line four, strike 367.04 and insert 367.05. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to members of the committee. Um, this is a change in service requirements for violation notices. So as many of you um, were made aware of when this was first introduced, the city currently requires per ordinance that all violation notices have to be issued by certified mail and they're also posted and photographed on the property. Um, this is problematic for a number of reasons, mostly because you know certified mail is almost impossible to get back. It costs over $7 a piece. We mail out thousands of violation notices, mostly never perfecting service on them. However, they're posted and photoed on the property. So this piece of legislation is designed to remove that requirement so that we can use regular mail and we can post and photo. And we believe this is going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and make us more efficient at getting these violation notices out. So we urge your support. Okay, post office is not, not, post office is not. Uh, <laughs> I have a question for him. My goodness, yeah. Uh, um, I, 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 I have to, just on the virtue of some of the challenges we have with the post office, how can we argue this? Um, but um, I do want to make sure, how do we make sure that we have a backup? You know, some seniors and some people in our community still rely on snail mail. Um, can you help us understand how we are going to get around that? Because I don't want us overlooking something mm -hmm. if we have people that still rely on that system. Sure. And to, to the chair, um, we would be mailing snail mail. We just won't be mailing it certified and expecting a return green card. So right now, if we send out a violation notice, it has a certified mail card. If we don't get the green card back signed, our law department won't allow us to move forward to, to prosecution because technically we haven't served the person. This would change the requirements so that regular mail will suffice along with post and photo, which we also do now with certified mail. So it's not changing that practice. It's just simply eliminating the certified mail. And of course, during COVID, the certified mail cards all came back saying could not be, get signature due to COVID. So we were stuck in the water. We couldn't move on with those violations. We couldn't process, prosecute them. And it was um, a true mess. Okay. So this will, do you think this will help with your prosecutorial rates? Yes. Have you seen where this has been used in other places? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, this, not many cities would ever require certified mail on violation notice. I mean, we certainly didn't um, in South Euclid. I mean, we simply just mailed out those violation notices. We didn't even post in photo. Um, so most cities don't use certified mail. It feels very um, antiquated and obsolete. But my only concern is, Director, does other, do other cities have the volume that we have? And that might be something that I just want to make sure, how do we make sure we have safeguards that mm -hmm. if we make this transition and it's not as smooth as we want to, mm -hmm. but we have to legislate to go back to the old way or do you have some safeguards in place so that we don't, um, so that if it doesn't end up the way that we want to, we can make some adjustments. So Mr. Chair, um, we would not be able to prosecute if we don't get certified mail service on the prosecution packet. So this is not taking that away. So if we, if we don't get resolution on the violation notice and we need to prosecute, they will obviously, the, the prosecutor staff will still be sending out certified mail for that to make sure we have service. So this just eliminates that step of having to send certified mail on every single violation notice, all those thousands of notices that go out. It's very inefficient and it takes a tremendous number of manpower hours to check to make sure those cards came back and track down those cards. So it just takes that step out. I, I really feel it's, it's an efficiency that probably we should have done a while ago here. Okay, uh, Councilman Harrison, this was heard in uh, DPS. Do you have any uh, questions? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no questions. I actually, I'm in full, full support of this uh, ordinance uh, because, as the director said, that this will help streamline some of the practices that the Building of Housing has had to endure over a number of years. Uh, you know, like I know, when somebody want to voice something, you ask, well, who is from? Uh uh, turn that away, give it back to them, right? <laughs> you know how it goes when folks uh, come to that door and want you to sign that card. <laughs> so, this really allows for us to strengthen, as we many, many members around this table has talked about and complained about is uh, code enforcement, code enforcement, code enforcement. This allows the director and her team to really be proactive, really to go out and kind of hammer uh, down in some of these communities where code enforcement just has been obsolete. Uh, and we, we all know, and you've heard it, you've mentioned it at this table as well, how important code enforcement is uh, if done correctly and what the benefits are of our community. So uh, the committee voted for this uh, fully, and we are in support of it. We think this, again, will be a, a great move in order to help uh, move the needle with some of the issues that we have been experiencing within the city of Cleveland for uh, quite some time. And as the director said, this does not uh, negate the requirement for, for the prosecutors to still send certified mail. So if it reaches that point where they are going to be prosecuted or sent to housing court, uh, whatever those cases are, that they still will have to send out certified notices in those instances. Uh, so that does not, this piece does not take away that requirement uh, for, for those. And so I stand in full support of the director in uh, this request uh, to amend this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman Harrison. Uh, Councilwoman Jasmine Santana. Kudos, congratulations. This is, I mean, we still haven't passed it yet, but this is <laughs> huge, especially serving a neighborhood um, as Ward 14 where we have so many slum lords. So through the chair, to the director, um, two questions that I have. So one is, so will this make it easier to prosecute and is the timeline quicker? Through the chair to the councilwoman, um, yes, because right now, if we send out a violation notice with certified mail and the cards don't come back, the prosecutor won't move forward with prosecuting that. So you can imagine how many cases we have that we can't move forward with because we failed to get the certified mail card. So this would eliminate that objection. Now, granted, they could still duck service on the prosecutor's side. Um, and I do want to point out that this does not change the certified mail requirement for condemnation notices. But that's important because we want to make sure everybody's fully served when we're going to take their property through a condemnation. So we didn't want to obviously change that. But I think what this will do is free up a lot of productivity. You'll probably see many more violation notices being issued because right now there's so much process that goes into issuing mm -hmm. one violation notice that I think the inclination of the staff is to only do it where it's egregious versus, you know, something that they could easily issue a notice on if it was just a mailed item. Mm -hmm. No, not so through the item. chair and the director. Are we still sending out three notices before going into prosecution? Because that's what's in place now, right? Like three certified mails and then prosecution. Well, I, I think we can simplify all of that. Okay. Yeah. And last but not least, um, so we know that while property owners are receiving notices, um, they go to the county and do that quick deed transfer to different LLCs, mm -hmm. right? So what is the next step? Because I already see that, you know, I could see property owners find, finding that loophole and already really hitting that system hard with transferring of quick deed. Through, through the chair to the councilwoman, that is a huge problem. And I think there's ways to deal with that that we haven't explored yet. So we do have a group of people, and, and Councilman Hairston is part of this kind of thinking on this stuff, as well as Councilman Harsh, um, including people with legal aid, people that represent council on both sides of the table in, in um, City Hall, to, to look at all of our uh, legislation and legislative pieces related to building and housing and do a deep dive on those to see if we can make them more efficient. Because the market continually changes, and the games people play just continue to go on. So we need to intercept them at every level. Uh, my way of thinking is violations go with the property. They don't go with the property owner. They're on the property. Mm -hmm. So I feel that you know reissuing a notice um, and with a lesser compliance date to a new owner is is fair. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's a process. We're doing the deep dive. We're going to come back to you all with quite a bit of amended legislation. Thank in you, the next Director, year. for your mm -hmm. leadership. On Thank this. you.
Thank you so much. I have Councilman Harrison that has yes. a follow up. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, to the director, will we mail to the house and the tax mailing address? Yeah. Or just one or the other? Um, through, through the chair to the councilman, both. Both, okay. Yeah, we, we want to make sure we get the mail to the right people. There you go, absolutely, because I know a lot, some, sometimes individuals just mail to the household. The owner may or may not live there, you know, but they have to check, check that tax mailing address to ensure that it is reaching the place where uh, whoever the uh, owner or operator is is receiving that information. Uh, and secondly, do you know, I see we have the director of health here because they also issue violation notices for junk and debris and high grass and others. Do we know if the health department uh, uh, sends, uh, Dr. Margolis, and, and maybe you know Director uh, Martin, do they send out? Do they have to send out certified notices per uh, legislative, um, any or, uh, per ordinance? Through the chair, I'm going to have to defer to Dr. Margolis. Can, if, if he can run up real quick, I, <laughs> Dr. Margolis, you want to join us or? I, I don't know the you might. Okay. Know okay. All right. But but we we can. I, I want us to find that out uh, because it may be. You know, this works for building housing, and if that is the same process for Department of Public Health, then we may should look at doing the same thing for that department because they also issue citations uh, and, and violation notices as well and tickets. Could All you right? restate that for uh, Mr. Titran so that we could get that uh, answer so for you? He, he got it. He got it? Yes, Okay, sir. got it. Great. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilman Mike Palencic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues. I am. Um, I wholeheartedly support the legislation, and um, I've always, um, for some reason, could never understand why the city, um, previous administrations, did not look at some of the surrounding suburbs. I always look to the city of Euclid as it pertains to how they would enforce their code, and I found it to be far more streamlined and effective, um, and it seems like over the years, attorneys, law department, which I believe, again, has been a major detriment here in the um, area of code enforcement, have seen to put one roadblock after another in front of our ability to enforce the housing code, which I could never understand. You know, in the suburbs, you can go on a piece of property. In the city of Cleveland, you couldn't. Um, I just, all, all these uh, impediments and roadblocks, one after another from my time here. When, when I first came in here, it seemed to be so much more easier to enforce the code than it is today. So I'm glad to hear, Director, that you're saying that you're going to bring before us various pieces of legislation to um, enhance the process here, because it's the number one complaint into my office daily, as it was again today. Housing complaints, building complaints, my neighborhood is being descended upon by the limited liability companies. They're buying up all the two-family homes. They're buying up everything they can, jacking up rents, sucking rent out of our city, and not putting money back in. So we have to also deal with the limited liability, figure out, and I've mentioned this to the mayor as well, uh, we've got to figure out how to, and the housing court judge, is how we're going to better uh, pierce the corporate veil around uh, limited liability companies and the um, statutory agents that they have. So my question specifically, when you serve legal, when you, you're serving notice, are you looking at all that? You're looking at the statutory agents? Are you looking at all that stuff as well when you send out the notices? Mm -hmm. Through the chair to the councilman, yes. Um, okay. We're also looking at pieces of legislation that can be changed to hold statutory agents more accountable. And when we say stat agents, we're really not talking about the ones that just take the mail. We're talking about the ones secretly behind the property, behind the maintenance decisions. Right. That's different than a normal statutory agent. So uh, we are aware of those people. And right now, we're looking at definitions in the code to change so that we hold them more accountable. We also are exploring um, like civil remedies instead of just criminal compliance, which we think will lead to better outcomes also. So we're also collaborating with the housing courts. So we've had a, a couple meetings and some dialogue as well. We feel like it just is going to take everybody coming to the table to, to make this go better because the market keeps changing constantly. You know, what the nonsense that's going on just keeps changing. Yes, okay. Well, we've, we've, we've coined the term the misery index, and we're in Ward 8, we're trying to increase the misery index for all these property owners who disrespect our community. So I'm, I'm from making their freaking lives miserable, okay, <laughs> Where, until they go someplace else um, and invest. My last question to you is this. At this point in time, eight months, 
into this administration, what would be your observation as to, as it, to where you're at in building housing? Because I, I, I tell you, I'm totally frustrated mm -hmm. dealing with it. I'm, I am totally frustrated and, and angry about turning in the same address and trying to explain to people why this property has sat there for eight years and nine years. I, I, don't, there's, I can't justify it. So what, what is your observation as to where you are, where the Bibb administration is at this point in time? Through the chair to the councilman, um, the administration is committed to fixing this. We know it isn't fixed. We know it's going to take time and legislative changes to fix it, uh, but I believe they will empower us to be able to do that. So I feel confident, or I wouldn't have come here, okay. that the Bibb administration does feel that way. Um, I would say, you know, the frustrating part of it is I think we've made it probably more complicated than it needed to be, you know, in some of our codes. And so unwinding that and doing it right and making sure those pieces are correct when I bring them to you is a huge priority for me. Okay. I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Chairman. The proof will be in the pudding. As I've said to the mayor, and I'm saying it again, um, one year from the day he was sworn in, it's no longer the previous administration's issues. It's his. Mm -hmm. And he ran on city services. I got all his legislation. I got all his pieces of literature. I got every piece. And I saw where it said city services, city services. So my, my position is that I'm going to hold the administration to accountability on city services. And, build, and I can't think of anything more important to our citizens, especially poor families and that are living in squalid conditions than housing code enforcement. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Councilman Palencia. Councilwoman Jenny Spencer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I simply wanted to comment. I really appreciate the direction that the director is going in with all of this. Um, I think the unwinding she's talking about will require an extraordinary level of attention to detail. And this legislation before us is really one step of many that will be taken. And I um, just want to express on behalf of all of our colleagues, please let us know how we can be helpful um, because this is, um, this is painstaking work, but it is absolutely essential. It's been a long time coming. I just wanted to express my enthusiasm and support for this, this step in the process. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Spencer. Saying no other uh, questions, ordinance number 612-2022 stands approved. Thank you, Director. Thank you. All right, I'm going to bring up Director Wong. And uh, the first. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, she's here for both? Mm -hmm. OK. I thought the Director Wong was here for 98, too. The bo both. Both? Mm -hmm. OK. All right. All right. So, Director Wong, and this is ordinance number 98-2022 as amended by Council Member Casey, an emergency ordinance to supplement the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976 by enacting new section 337.19 relating to related to parking recreational vehicles in a residential district. And uh, we're also joined at the table by our attorney, uh, Attorney Scalish. So I will start off with, uh, I believe, Director Martin, and then we'll go to Director Wong, and then um, the, the Attorney Scalish, if she can give us background on this as well. Director Martin. Thank you to the chair, to the committee. Um, we right did work with Attorney Scalish and also Councilman Casey to make some modifications to this ordinance that we believe will make it far more enforceable. So as it stands amended, the Building and Housing Department has no further comment. Uh, Director Wong? Am Sim I saying that right? You are. Okay. Yeah, you're doing great. Uh, to the chair, uh, excuse me, let me move this closer. Um, I, I also uh, want to add that there is um, something in our code that I'm gonna to have to bring up in a second on my computer that uh, allows for um, apprehension of such vehicles, um, again, as a means of enforcement, um, but I also do not have further comments. 
Thank you. And before I go to Attorney Scalish, I do want to make sure I read the amendments. I've been taught to make sure I read the amendments. And it says there is no legal objection to this legislation if amended as, followed, as follows. In the title, line one, strike emergency. Number two, strike the whereas clause in its entirety. Three, in section one at section 337.19A, line three, after trailer, insert boat on trailer, and in division B to C, line one, after repair, insert and in workable condition, in quotations, and in division B to E, line three, between notwithstanding and the period insert, except that no screening shall exceed six feet in height. Strike, and number four, strike section two in its entirety and insert section two, that this ordinance shall take effect and be in force from and after the earliest period allowed by law. And those are the amendments. Attorney Scalish, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. Uh, to the to the committee. Ordinance 98-2022 uh, regarding parking recreational vehicles in residential districts enacts new section 337.19 to regulate parking resident recreational vehicles in city residential districts. It addresses the problem of jamming up large recreational vehicles on tiny lots or in between properties. And um, it'll, it also addresses the problem of living in those recreational vehicles on foreclosed properties and some people even tap into the electrical lines on the properties itself, the houses themselves for free electricity. This new section addresses these issues in one place in the zoning code, making it clear what is permitted and what is not. It would make for easier enforcement. A recreational vehicle is a ve ve vehicular portable structure designed solely for recreational travel. It includes, but isn't limited to a boat, a boat trailer, a boat on a trailer, jet ski and a raft and associated equipment used to transport, a travel trailer, motorhome, pickup camper, folding tent trailer, and licensed private trailer used to haul personal property. The section um, uh, requires that it must be stored in a closed garage, mm. except that a person may park one recreational vehicle in the open on a concrete parking space in the rear yard. It, uh, right, right now, the, rec uh, the um, vehicle cannot be more than 25 feet in length, not including a hitch or attachment. Um, it must be in good repair and workable condi condition. It may be parked in the driveway or in any parking area around the, the home on the property for loading and unloading for not more than 48 hours in any consecutive 21-day mm. period. We had a discussion uh, last week in DPS committee um, that brought up that their current code sections um, might be du duplicative of, of, um, of what we are saying here in 337.19. Um, but the feeling from council is that these sections don't effectively address these issues. Um, and while they may be scattered throughout the zoning code, this, this section, this, amend this amendment, would just have these regulations in one place where everybody can go and know what is, is uh, re re what is prohibited, what isn't, and what's, what's, uh, what they can and cannot do. Um, there are two amendments that I'd like to um, proffer uh, for council to make at the table here. And this is after the discussion in DPS and with a discussion with um, building and housing. Um, in division B to D, we'd like to change the length of the, of the uh, uh, vehicle from 25 feet to 30 feet in length. And also, would like to delete uh, Division C, which was requiring a parking permit um, or a permit for having these recreational pole vehicles and charging five dollars. We'd like to delete that requirement entirely. Okay, so there have been two amendments proffered on the floor. Chair, sure. Chair cannot um, offer those. Do I have a motion, Mr. Chair? Um, I move that we adopt the amendments as read by um, Attorney Scalish. Motion has been made. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Those amendments will be offered. 
Uh, we'll Thank submit you. them to Attorney Roberts uh, in order to make sure that they are added to the legislation. Mr. Chair, can I be yes. added to this legislation? Please add Councilwoman Santana to this legislation. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, All right. Uh, seeing no one else, so Councilwoman Santana will be added to this. Uh, I do have Councilman Polinsic. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues, to, the, to our director, uh, I think to our law, uh, law person, uh, and to the director of building and housing and to the city planning director. Um, what about uh, mobile home parks? If they're parking an RV in a mobile home park, what impact does this have? Mobile home parks aren't recreational districts, right? So this doesn't have any impact on that. Are you sure? Um, I'd have to check and make sure. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll have to check the zoning code, but I, my assumption is that they are different yeah. um, based on our definitions. Because they're at Euclid Beach Mobile Home Park, some people have now have RVs in the park. Okay. I'll we'll have to take a look at that. So I, I want to make sure that uh, we are not uh, putting an undue burden upon West Reserve Land Conservancy, the company that just bought, the agency that just mm. bought the property, yeah. mm -hmm. as it pertains to would they be forced to evict those uh, individuals and those residents who have set up in RVs at this point in the park? We'd have to look at, at the definitions in the zoning code, uh, Council. Okay. Please make sure all conversations okay. go through the chair. And then secondly, uh, what about uh, mobile food trailers? To the chair as a clarification, is are you saying food trucks or food, is it something Food trucks, different? food trailers. Food trailers. I've been having a new problem with that all of a sudden with people right. park it, parking their mobile food trailer in their yard. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, on East 93rd, there's a very popular food truck. And I know for a fact that he, pop, he, he parks it in, actually I think it's Councilman Bishop's ward, um, but it's right on the border of six and two. And he parks, great truck, but he parks it in his driveway when he's not using it. So don't know how that might be. Yeah. So if, if yeah, need be, because I, yeah. I just had a, a confrontation on the street over the trailer that they pulled in the yard and, and parked it on the lot next to their home. And there was a confrontation with the neighbors. So I would make, it need be make a motion that um, an a, 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 a amendment that mobile food trailers tra slash trucks be incorporate in this as well. Uh, Councilman, just to clarify your amendment, because I, I hear you, and I want to make sure it's clear, um, and I want to just push you a little further. I don't know if I'm doing this right according to Robert's Rules of Order, but how can we make sure that it's not someone saying that, oh, this is a food truck so they can park it there? Does it have to be legally registered or licensed and um, well, Mr. Chairman, everything with the health department, or how do we make sure that it's not somebody using that as a loophole? And I, I agree with you. I, I can't um, second or make the amendment, but I think you're on to something. I just want to make sure that we don't give somebody an unnecessary loophole. Well, it, you cannot, and the director hopefully can clarify, under my understanding of the code, you cannot park a commercial vehicle in a residential yard. Right. And a food truck, and they've got the food stuff on it. They're painted up food trucks and trailers. Um, and you can see that they're food trucks and trailers, that that is a commercial vehicle. And they should not be allowed to park that in a residential use district. So if need be, again, I will continue my, my, um, my amendment, my motion I admit, to include those um, food trucks, um, food um, trailers, Whatever how you did, that, I just call them food trailers, mobile food trailers, mobile food trucks as well. My intention is to deal with the Dukes of Hazard who think they can do whatever they want. Okay, in these neighborhoods, I got some idiot just parked a stock car in front of his house. I mean, 
this is unacceptable, unacceptable. I'm not going to live like that. And I, I don't expect my citizens to live like that. So um, you want to run a business, go find a place to park your commercial vehicle in a legitimate area. Yeah. Uh, I think that the director was, going, was looking at something. I don't know if I jumped ahead. And I made a motion. Councilman Polinsic has a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second. Okay, Councilman Casey has a second, so uh, it's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Mr. Chairman, just for my clarification. Councilman McCormick. This will, in addition to what's in the legislation, will add food trucks and trailers. It will prohibit them from being parked in a driveway or side yard or something of that nature. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so yep. we add that to the definition of recreational vehicle. Okay, thank you. And this would, but this would not prevent, um, I, I have residents who get ice cream trucks for neighborhood parties or for a birthday party. That's not the issue. It, it wouldn't interfere it wouldn't with prevent that. that. Okay, no. just wanted to clarify, right. thank you. Um, yeah. uh, Director Wong, I, and we're still in discussion. Um, I want to make sure that we have any discussion. Director Wong, do you have um, anything to input into the conversation? Chair, just point of clarification. Um, I do want to make sure that this is airtight with our zoning code, as it sounds like we're going to be adding food trucks under the definition of recreational vehicles. And I don't think that's completely accurate. It should be under a commercial, commercial vehicle. vehicles. Um, and and our, yes, uh, apologize. I want to see if you have any additional comments on that. Thank you. Yeah. Through the chair, um, I, I was, I don't know, but I think that mobile food trailers and, and, and mobile food trucks are considered commercial vehicles now, currently. Mm -hmm. um, if not, they should be. That really doesn't fall into a recreational vehicle. The idea of a recreational vehicle is not to ride around in your mobile food truck and recreate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I understand yeah. what you're saying, um, yeah, Councilman right. Plensick. But I'm not sure that this is the, the proper place to put mobile food trailer. Okay, well then I would I would respectfully request then that then I'll ask again to you, Rachel, if you could please look yeah. at that and if we need to put together a subsequent piece of legislation yeah. Yeah. as it pertains to a residential use district because I'm having this problem with all of a sudden they're popping up and I don't understand why they're popping yeah, up. Because this state's boat, trailer, I'm trying to look when I said jet that. ski, raft, and associated equipment for um, travel trailer, motor home, pickup camper, folding tent trailer, and a licensed private trailer intended to haul personal property. Your U-Haul. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, is my is my restaurant equipment personal property? I don't know. If I could, because I want to make sure that I'm okay. following the conversation. Councilman Polensic, are you tabling your amendment until if, we have if, further yeah, research? I, if need be, I will. I, I don't want to belabor okay, the point. Okay, so Councilman Polensic has a, yeah. he wants to table his amendment upon to have further research to see if we need subsequent, um, subsequent discussion and legislation on this matter. Um, I believe I need a second to table his amendment. Second. The table, the amendment has been moved and seconded. Right. Um, so the amendment has been tabled. Uh, however, we do want to follow up and get clarity um, to see if we might need a subsequent amendment. And the only thing that I'd ask as chair that we make sure that we don't inadvertently or unexpectedly, to Councilman McCormick's point, right. uh, punish a very viable business that just may um, be parking their vehicle in a commercially lease space or something like that. So if sure. we could just make sure we look at that as well. Uh, I have come to Councilman Bishop, but I have Councilman Conwell, Councilman Harrison, and then Councilman Bishop. Uh, on the original piece of legislation. Sure, no, I, I'm good. Uh, you just uh, spelled out exactly what I was about to say as, as a recommendation while we further work through this, so I'm good. Conwell? You know what? I just want to do a side one, and, and I'm, I'm good also. Mr. President, we push all these laws and then it falls back on the council member, Mr. Uh, council member Mike Palencic. And we got all the laws in the books. We probably even have this law in the book, but they don't execute. They don't execute. And we get the phone up, we get the phone calls, and we get beat up on it. The law is good, and I agree with even with Council Member 
Mike Pulisic is uh, introducing, and he knows it. We talk about it all the time. They got to work. You got to execute on it. And that's just where I'm at. And, I, and it's frustrating. Councilman, I completely agree with you. And uh, before I go to Councilman Bishop, I'm going to take... Uh, I'm gonna take Attorney Scalish on a way back trip that me and Councilwoman Santana started researching pre-COVID where we actually started looking at an ordinance um, that Council, I mean that Attorney Scalish uh, started drawing up. I got one of those memories. The, I through the remember. chair, it's drafted. It's drafted. <laughs> so I would like if we could maybe look and see if we might be able to look at that and okay. make some amendments there. because or, or That was on or, commercial vehicles. Yeah, on commercial yeah. vehicles sure that because works. I agree with you that whole just get a brand new recreation vehicle or truck and just park it anywhere is really um, a detriment to our community and our neighborhoods. And I really like if we could recirculate that because I know that Councilwoman Santana and myself has started researching that pre-COVID. Um, so if you could share that with each, of, with each of the council members and then if maybe we could use that as a starting point for this discussion. Okay, thank you. And, and, and through the chair, I'd also like to um, um, work with the planning director and the building and housing director to make sure that we've got the right definitions in the commercial in the commercial vehicle part of the of the zoning code. So, Councilman Polensic, you cool with that? I'm fine with that. Okay, Councilman Bishop. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in this in this uh, ordinance, the a trailer uh, and most most of the trailers I have in my neighborhood are are landscape trailers. Uh, and for landscape equipment, that that is not included here, is it? No. 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 Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. So once again, we'll get that ordinance to everyone and make sure that um, Attorney Scalish is also going to work with uh, Director Wong and uh, Director Martin to make sure that we uh, look at that. Okay. And if, and if they would please check out the issue with the mobile with the mobile home parks. Okay. That and if you guys could also get back to us, Ms. Uh, Council, I mean, uh, Mr. Titran, if you can make sure that we get a follow up on the definition on if this uh, ordinance number 98 will affect the uh, mobile home parks because we do know that we have that um, exemption. Um, so I believe that we are back at the original um, ordinance number 98-22 uh, as amended. Uh, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 98-2022 uh, stands approved with uh, Councilwoman Santana added as a co-sponsor, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, the only thing that I will add, and this is more research, I mean, you get, you get exposure on things just at the right time. I just actually got back from um, a convening out west and they have a very, a very big homeless problem in California and there are a lot of people that squat because they're homeless and they squat in cars and, 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 and these kind of trailers and everything else. Now, I know that this is a sincere problem. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we kind of look at that as well. They call it the vehicle triage center, where they actually have created areas where they actually uh, create areas that they zone specifically uh, for these kind of places for homeless communities and others to live in. So I just want to make sure that as we put these laws in place to Councilman Conwell's point, um, he got me saying that now we got to manage the legislation to make sure that we <laughs> are doing this the right way. Um, so I just want us to keep those things in mind so that we don't inadvertently harm other people, okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 98-2022 as amended stands approved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank All right. Uh, I will now move to... I will now move to... Ordinance number 895-2022 yeah. as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of City Planning to create the Transformative Public Arts Project Fund Program and to enter into grant agreements under the program. Uh, before I go any further, I want to offer an amendment. Uh, first and foremost, Councilman Conwell, would you like to be added to this because I know that you have 
have been working on this as a uh, public arts project, or is this something that you yes, want? Yes, yes, add, add me to it. Okay, so Councilman, can we add Councilman Conwell to ordinance number 895-2022? And uh, the second thing that I want to do is make sure that I read the amendment. There is no legal objection to this legislation if amended as followed. In section one, at the Eight, nine, end, five. insert in the estimated amount of $3 million artist participation in the projects funded by this program shall include 50% local artist participation. Now, I've been asked um, by Councilman McCormick and others that the law department would like us to make sure that we more um, definitively define local artist participation. So as an amendment, I will give Councilman McCormick a first crack at how do we expand what that local artist participation looks like. I can assume that it's someone who is regionally but also has roots in the city of Cleveland. How can we have this uh, def be more definitive on how we describe local? And, and maybe even director yeah. have some ideas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, again, the comment commentary from the law department, which I agree with, is is better defining local, because what does that mean? And we also want to ensure that we're not excluding folks who, and again, Mr. President, I am normally a brat about the city of Cleveland, city of Cleveland, city of Cleveland, city of Cleveland, but I think if we just restrict this to city of Cleveland residents who are artists, it's going to be quite restrictive. So I, I think I would advise against that. Um, and then you get to Cuyahoga County, Mr. President. And if, is there someone that lives in Wycliffe that grew up in Cleveland that's a great art? Yeah. So it's just become, I, I, I'm, I would, I guess I would go away from really prescriptive language. And I know generally we like to legislatively Board direct, number. but I think that in this case, uh, providing some leeway for the department oh. to analyze that is going to be our best bet here because I don't know. What geographic area? I mean, we could do the Noaka zone, which is the five-county region, was another idea. But and I would love to hear what, because um, I know that Councilman Starr really uh, originally put this forth. I would love to hear what Director Wong has to say. Uh, and let me state this, just for the record, I know that we uh, in this in uh, Ward Six had the Elevate the East project, mm -hmm. and part of that was due to making sure we had input from the local community, which meant that you kind of can keep it broad, that even if it's someone who comes from um, Texas or Youngstown or yeah. California, that they must have um, some type of input or some type of engagement with the local community, which I think is even more important mm -hmm. um, than actually saying the artists it's themselves have to come from. That's the right, because it could be but, a, a local artist who just right. says forget the community and exactly. Yeah. So, important. director, do you have any uh, comments or think <laughs> any anything to offer to us, to proffer sure. to us for this amendment? Sure. Uh, thank you to the chair and to the council members. Uh, we had a really good uh, discussion this morning. Thank you to uh, Council Member Conwell uh, for entertaining all of the discussion and questions. Um, I will say, generally, I am on board with the spirit of the intent, which is to include our local artists and the local economy. I think where there are some challenges, and I'll just list out a few challenges, I think, A, um, from a pragmatic side, we have to um, get this money out the door by 2026 and curating um Curating art often can have many twists and turns and you often want to start with a, a larger pool. Um, C, B, or C, whatever I'm, I'm on, I, I don't know, it's been a long day. Um, um, I think that uh, it can be very hard to define local as several of you have raised and then um, finally I just think that um, we often get the same artists supplying over and over again who define themselves as local artists. And so um, I, I do believe that 50% local and 50% non-local, however we define that, will allow for that fellowship between artists for greater learning and greater connections. Um, and so therefore, I, I would really like to define local as Cuyahoga County, Lorain County, perhaps Summit County to include Akron, 
Um, and I think you had mentioned some other Noaka. Noaka but, yeah. is everything except for Lake. Summit. Right. It's Lake, Giaga, Medina, um, Lorraine, and Cuyahoga. Uh, and in Giaga. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, would, I would add to that Summit County because of Akron. However, I think you know, it's always preferred to have an artist who lives in the city of Cleveland and is hyper-local. I think it often becomes very difficult to curate depending on the type of project it is. So keeping it open with the intent and the principle of hiring hy hyper-local is, is there. So. How about we offer this up? Because what Mr. you just President. described is the MSA. I mean, the Metropolitan Mr. Strategic Mr. Area. Sure, sure. Um, one, one second, Councilman, I'll come to you. Um, but you described pretty much the Metropolitan Strategic yeah. Area. I think you're a city planner. Am I saying that right? MS? MSA, it is including a few other counties beyond the MSA. Okay, yeah. so if we did MSA. But um, I, 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 just, I do agree with um, what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that uh, we... Um, I, yeah, let's 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 think through that because I just want to make sure. And my idea is more important for me about the community, mm -hmm. yeah. making sure that there's um, participation from the uh, ward or census tract, which I think is just as important as who the actual artist is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know no, I if uh, you have something that describes that, but mm -hmm. do you have something that you could put and then I'll come to Councilman Conwell. Sure, chair to the council member. Um, yes, uh, in addition to the curation of the artists themselves, uh, the discussion around how communities can be involved also came up this morning. And um, you know, it, at first it was mm -hmm. you know, the department oversight of the program selection through a program application process, but um, you know, it's really good points raised. So our suggestion now as a draft is to assemble a transformative public arts committee that would include residents from each of the districts in our planning districts. Um, it could include one council member, it could include local arts leaders who really understand the curation process. Um, this group would then develop the principles for the programming um, and the vision, which would then be presented um, through various community meetings for broad acceptance of it. And so as there are programs that are being applied for, they will meet quarterly to review them. Um, and of course, when there is a neighborhood specific program, which this is intended to do, there will be fairly deep engagement with that council member, any community organizations that are involved, and then also uh, the community themselves to determine the type of art, the style of art, perhaps selecting the artists. The only thing I would ask is not to direct the art, which can be easy to do because we want to allow artists to have that freedom to, to define what they want their art to be. Right. And, and, and before I go to Councilman Conwell, the reason why this is so important, I just recently went through this with the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. And they brought in an artist from New York. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the Gods of Dust and Wind or something that's at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And brilliant artists, great people, but what they did is they actually worked with local residents in order to develop the artistic mm -hmm. pieces. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to have a world-renowned artist that comes in with we wear the mask and mm -hmm. other type of artistic projects, and we shut them out of our market right. when they can easily come in and work with the local community. So I don't know if you have that written, but um, I think that is the perfect kind of format. That's kind of what we utilize with the Elevate the East project and others. Uh, but Councilman Conwell, I know you had the floor, and then Councilman Palencic. Yeah, I like, I like the way um, the, the director just narrated it. You know, it's like this with almost any job or project or um, and I see this in Cleveland a lot. You may have a great reporter. You may have a great uh, person that's in basketball or a great artist that's right in front of you, uh, to, uh, Mr. Mr. President. And then in Cleveland, they say, oh, no, this person is not great. Let me go to New York or let me go to uh, New Orleans to get someone else. But right in front of you, right in front of you, here's a great individual that might even be better than the person from New York. 
And so what happens a lot in Cleveland, like it even happened with Rockefeller, you, you, you end up letting your talent escape Cleveland. And when I go to other cities to play and play music, I see a lot of my buddies, they're in New Orleans. They're in, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, what's this other, they're in uh, New York, they're in New Jersey. And I say, why did you leave, man? Because I couldn't get a break in Cleveland. And then you see them at the Academy Awards. You see them in, at the, uh, at the, in the, uh, a lot of the different awards, and people say, I'm from Cleveland. Think about that. You know I'm telling the truth. Because you bypass your talent here. And when you get people from our city, then you can feel the vibes and the atmosphere and the culture of your community. They're from your community. Why do you think we had a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame right behind us? We created that. Cleveland created that. And when you come to Cleveland, you can't even feel the rock and roll vibes. But when you go to Nashville and, and Memphis, you feel the country and Western. They keep their people there and they're homegrown. So with this legislation, 50% is enough. When you say 50%, try to get your own people and cultivate your own people and cultivate the talent that's right here in Cleveland so they can stay here in Cleveland. Someone come from New York, Mr. President, guess what? They'll come here, get this basket full of money, and guess what? They'll go back to, to New York and spend the money in New York and build the economy up in, in New York. And the individual that you could have gotten here will end up leaving, moving to Los Angeles or somewhere else, and you'll see them win a Grammy. We need to cultivate our own people. We need to spend money in our own neighborhoods. We need to deal with the poverty that's here and try to cultivate some of the, even the children that's in our community, and we do that through the arts. And that's just where I'm at. Home, cultivate our own people, our homegrown people. So that's where I'm at on, on this piece here. And, and I agree with um, Council Member um, Starr for putting it like that. And let me say this, Mr. President, let me say this to my conclusion. And, 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 and Council Member Mike Polinsky been here a long time also. One time we passed $43 million at the table, $43 million. And guess what Ms. Lewis said? Fannie Lewis, the former great uh, council lady, and not a dime stayed in Cleveland. Not one dime. And Councilmember Mike Polensky, he knows that. We always talk about that. That's how we fight poverty for our people. So that 50%, that's cool beans, man. I'm tired of going places in Chicago and places like that and I see our people there. Let's give them a break. Let's try to help cultivate our people. And if we're going to fail, let's fail on our people, our board of directors, our bosses. And that's where I'm at. Thank you very much. And Councilman, just make sure that we clarify, because I want to get back to uh, director's amendment or what she's proffering to us. Um, the... This is only pertaining to the three million allocated through 895 2022. So we could still do other artists all over, but this is about $1.5 million that will be dedicated just out of this $3 million to local artists. So, Man, you know what? I don't care if it's 1.5 cents, Penny, we can keep it here for our residents to benefit the residents in Ward no. 6. Ward 15. Comes from I'm agreeing with you. That's what I'm saying. That's what this quarter. is. If right. It's a quarter, if it can benefit Brian Casey residents, I'm cool with I think we all are saying the same thing. What I'm saying is the way that this is written, like if we didn't change it at all right. and we didn't touch this, 1.5 million would still be dedicated directly. It is true. It is true. So, but I'm saying is, yeah, but so yeah. what I'm saying is under this amendment that Star put there, yeah. 1.5 regardless, if we it's didn't regardless. do anything, would it's still regardless. be local out of this right. three million. But right. to your point, should we add or could we, and I don't know if Attorney Roberts can give us some advice on that, but uh, if we could add that clause to it, how that would look. Attorney uh, Roberts, can you, you give us some notes? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Makes sense. Attorney Roberts? No, I, I certainly respect um, uh, Chair uh, Conwell from this morning, his sentiments and that he um, has summarized just now. And also, I understand, as Director Wong does too, um, where Councilman Starr was coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm really happy that we're having this discussion, and I'm happy that Councilman McCormick you know, brought it out, like, how do you define, um, yeah. uh, you know, what is local, you know, that's a vague term for sure. Also, 
we have the, we have the percentage, you know, 50 percent, 50 percent of the total funds, 50 percent of the number of artists, 50 percent of the number of projects. That's not defined either. Um, and and I, I just inherent to the piece, and I don't know, maybe Director Wong was a little surprised about this attention, but you know, this the the transformative public art projects fund program is going through our local CDCs. They're inherently looking at our local artists. They are part of the local community. Um, I, you know, I would somewhat trust that this is a local piece. Um, however, but you know, I, and I think that Director Wong wants to comment on that, but we do need to f more, more fully define both what 50% is actually dividing or, or identifying, and then what is the territory where these art and, is it where their studio is, where they were born, where they reside, where their office, I, you know, I think it's complicated to throw that in, just technically speaking, even when you define local even further. Um, so those are just my, since we're in discussion on the Amendment. We would probably need to rescind the, this morning's amendment to re, to um, a reissue, an reissue, amendment. reissue an amendment. I think that's the cleaner approach, um, Mr. Chair. Okay. okay. So Councilman McCormick has a point on Attorney Roberts, and then I'm going to give Director Wong an opportunity to uh, respond. Councilman Just McCormick. very quickly to our Assistant Law Director. Uh, you hear a lot in the Ohio Revised Code or otherwise that if something is silent on an issue, um, if, if, the law, if our law was silent on an issue as to what local meant, would that discretion then just fall back to the administration? Meaning, do we need to further define this or does the general nature of local allow the administration to interpret that? Attorney Roberts? Mm. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I would not, and I understand what you're saying about what if you are silent as to further defining it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yes. we're not silent as into including the term local. Um, I, I generally, and it, the default should be not to have vague language in a okay and piece of legislation. But you're probably right. But you would be not ensuring that that default would happen. Thank you. Okay, um, Director Wong. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is pretty much the reason why I was feeling hesitant in the beginning of the discussion around this specific legislation because I think you then begin to get very, very technical and very, very specific. Um, and to clarify, I, it would be 50% program participation from artists. Um, this is a fund that is to support and leverage foundation or private dollars into this transformative arts fund. And so I want to help us think of it as a program and per project, project. rather than we are going to deliver dollars direct to artists to install on private property, for example. So it's a little bit esoteric, but no. I want to think of it as we're, we want to get art into neighborhoods we want 50% program participation at least by local artists from those six counties that we named. And hopefully that is specific enough. So a couple of things. Yep. And I want to make sure that I follow with the intent of what this is, because I think it goes back to Councilman Conwell's point. Mm -hmm. Then if we are using this as ARPA funds, um, I forgot what ARPA even stands for, American Rescue Plan Act dollars. And if we're using it for that, then I would say that all 3,000 of the dollars should go to Cleveland resident artists. And let me, make, let me say why I'm saying that, because to your point, if this is about a stimulus, let's use that word, a stimulus economic development opportunity for local artists, why not we say the city of Cleveland proper? And why not we say um, that we're going to take care of our artists in the city of Cleveland with this fund? Can I get a point I'm just, I just, I just, I just, I just want to, 
put that out there because I think you make a good point, and that's where I was kind of headed, is that if this is sort of ARPA dollars for Cleveland, this is not ARPA dollars for New York. This is not ARPA dollars for Akron. They already have their ARPA dollars. This is ARPA dollars for Cleveland. Therefore, this should be Cleveland born, bred, living, residential, have an address, either business or residence in the city of Cleveland. Um, because remember, we still can do other projects that are outside of this $3 million allocation that can include and bring in artists from all over the world. Right. But this actual specific fund is a project that city planning can use to help cultivate and develop artists that reside or have businesses in the city of Cleveland and should be able to prove whether they live or live, work, or something in the city of Cleveland. And that's what I would like to look at this as, but before I go back to you, Director, Councilwoman Santana had a point. Good. Um, thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Good point, just Blade. very yeah, brief. No, no. It is you. my understanding, too, that the county also allocated ARPA dollars right. to yeah. an art fund, so can the county focus on the other counties in the area and then we solely focus on city Cleveland residents. And keep in mind, it could be residents and also, if I was to look at it, Local and business. somebody who has businesses like galleries in um, Little Italy, Waterloo Arts District, Tremont, Clark Fulton. So this is a Cleveland investment, Cleveland business and resident investment yeah. fund. I'm, I'm just yeah. asking. Mm -hmm. But director yeah. and- And one, one sure. more question that I have. Oh, it just slipped my mind. Forget, I'll think about so. Oh, you know what, just one, I know me and you are, I'm feeling your energy. Now, one other question that I have is from my experience, we have enough local artists or business, um, you know, art businesses. They just don't know how to apply for this funding. Yeah, yeah so. I, I anticipate that we could spend this $3 million on local artists. So I know the director had a point, and then I'll come to Councilman Mike Pulisic. Thank you. To the chair, to the council members, um, to uh, the point, the county did deliver ARPA dollars both to CAC and to Assembly for the Arts. Those are primarily for relief dollars relief dollars so it's the idea that oh I, I lost money during ARPA and you know I'm a performing artist and because all the performing arts venues were closed I'm applying for relief dollars or you know and, and so this is meant to complement the already existing funds out there which are for artists to recoup um, I do want to to remind uh, um, that the idea is Yes, we are, we are having artists participate in this, but all of the art delivery are gonna be in Cleveland neighborhoods. And so infusing a ton of art into specific neighborhoods, um, that is going to help benefit Cleveland neighborhoods because that will drive economic development in those areas. And so that's the other side of the coin is... is Hold on, hold on, one second, one second. Let, let, let me let her finish, then I'll come back to you. So go ahead, Council. Sure, and I'm so I'm open to the dialogue, but I think the idea is, you know, being able to have more artists participate equals probably more art <laughs> out in the neighborhoods. Um, so in Ohio City, in Creative Fusion, you, there's visual arts, and it was both local and national, or in, even international artists, but they were working together to create something for that particular neighborhood. And so, yes, we could, we could have leveraged funds that support this program, and we, we need to actually have leveraged funds. Um, I just want to put that point out there that all of the art delivery is going to be in Cleveland neighborhoods. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We get Councilman Polensic, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Councilman Conwell um, if he could sit there and maybe um, have a conversation real quick, a sidebar with Attorney Roberts and uh, Director Wong, and then proffer an amendment to us of what you guys think should happen. Does that sound fair? So then that way we could just not try to sit here and have a five-hour conversation about the arts. You, Ms. Wong, can maybe 
go and talk with um, Attorney Roberts and kind of proffer an amendment to us and then come back to the table to the Finance Committee so that we don't continue to just yeah, yeah, yeah. hammer this out. So, so Councilman Polinsic and then we'll come back. Thank you. No, not until they come to yeah. today to have a sidebar and then say here's what we offer as an amendment. Okay, Councilman uh, Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues and to the director. Um, I, I feel very strongly about this. Uh, if you look at goals, equity, and community impact, uh, if, if you do 50 percent, you're going to you're going to only have a handful of of local artists um, benefiting from this. So I'm of the opinion uh, I have the Waterloo Arts District. I have a uh, arts. Uh, I think I like to think um, arts district on East 185th Street that's starting to grow. I feel very strong that this has to be for Cleveland-based artists. Cleveland-based organizations, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues. I mean, w again, it's been stated, the county, other cities have, um, have ARPA funds. Um, if we don't do our, our uh, if we don't make our due diligence to try to keep these dollars in the city. Uh, when you talk about starving artists, I've got some starving artists in my neighborhood you know, you got an that, that, are, that, are, that are trying. And they're not, and they're, and they're really struggling. And so, you know, I'm opposed to 50% uh, or 60%. I, I'm for trying to keep as much of this in these dollars in the city of Cleveland for our artists, our, our CDCs, our art organizations, et cetera. Because again, I, I want to say, my God, go back to look what it says under equity, under goals, under community impact. That's what the focus should be. It's right in the, it's right in the, in the outline in front of us. Right. So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, charity starts at home. And if we don't look out for our own people, the only thing I don't understand, Mr. Chairman, the mechanics of this, yeah. you know, how it's going to be implemented. Um, you know, uh, what role does the city council play? Are we going to have input into the process? Our, uh, I have a real problem if, if everything's got to go through that ridiculous design and review process with all, with all those frustrated architects and city planning sitting on those design and review committees, you know, because I, I have very little use for that, those groups anymore uh, after what I've experienced in my own community. So I, I just, I, I'm not clear on the mechanics. Other than that, I'm for the three million staying in the city of Cleveland. Okay, so here's what okay. we're going to do. Charles Slife, Councilman Slife, has a point that he would like to make. Sure. Once again, I am going to hold this for a second, just for a moment. I want to get back to it today. I don't want to punt this till tomorrow or next week. What I would like to do is hold it while Councilman Conwell and Director Wong have an honest discussion because I honestly believe that there's definitions that she gave as well as what Councilman is trying to do that can let local, I mean, let artists that don't live in the city of Cleveland participate, but to make sure that the economic impact is primarily, solely, whatever we come up with Cleveland. But I'm gonna give it to Slife, and then I'm going to uh, release her for a moment just to have a sidebar with Councilman Conwell, and hopefully they can come right back and proffer us an amendment that we all believe we could live with, okay? Because I, I don't want this taken into a five hour life of its own. Councilman Slife, and then and, go from there. And I will be very brief, Mr. President, because I have a five o'clock in the neighborhood. Um, but just two things, uh, and, and thank you for letting me speak, obviously not on finance. One is I, I sit on the uh, public art uh, committee f as council's representative, and just anecdotally I can say the artists that come through, th so this is when we have dollars set aside in, in public improvement projects, a certain percentage goes towards public art, very frequently the same artists coming through. So my worry is that there are many artists in Cleveland, no one's gonna deny that, but our, when you start, you know, here's how many artists there are and then how many are interested in this opportunity, how many are able to deliver, how many have the financial ability to like structure themselves a business or to have a pass-through organization like a CDC, I worry that that census becomes too small and if we are overly restricted in how we define local, do we end up really only benefiting uh, maybe a dozen artists who are the ones already in town who have the wherewithal to do these projects, and, and we leave out someone who maybe lives in East Cleveland or grew up in the, in the city but you know moved into Brook Park and, and you know still very much identifies with, with the city but doesn't have that postal address right now. Um, that's my one point. The second point, and, and this is maybe in a, a bit more 
blunt than what the director was willing to say, but I, I, when I saw this legislation come across the board, I didn't re view it as relief dollars for artists in the city per se. The primary objective is to have a surge of art coming into our neighborhoods. The, the, the end goal, I understand, is for us to be able to drive through the city, especially art deserts, southeast side, but even parts of the southwest side, that just don't have public art right now. And if we want to achieve that quickly and achieve that and have meaningful good art, I think we have to broaden the pool a little bit more to be able to pull people in because it just, just, just do, 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 are there enough artists in Cleveland to be able to deliver that level of art in this amount of time. Uh, so, so my preference as a non-member of the Finance Committee would be a more broadened definition of local uh, simply because I think that it meets the, the, the objectives and goals of this legislation and in increasing the, the amount of art, knowing that there are also relief services out there provided by other, other governments, other agencies. So th thank you. So once again, um, I'm going to ask if Councilman Conwell and Director Wong can get together with Attorney um, Roberts briefly. And I am not adverse to having an A, B, C, and D category. I just think that it needs to be flexible enough, but also make sure that we are having an economic impact and also making sure that we are stimulating the city of Cleveland. So I'm okay with the conversation. I just wanna make sure uh, if you guys can take a sidebar and proffer an amendment, okay? Thank you. Thank you, and then I'll see you back in about, if we could, about 15 minutes, and, and, and then the, if that. Who's gonna work out the mechanics? They, that's their job. The administration can handle that part, okay? Great. All right, okay, all right, real quick. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, come on up, uh, Director. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. Director, I am going to be quick. You are going to be lucky because you only got five people to talk to right now. Don't I look lucky All right. right okay, now. ordinance number 855-2022 by council members Conwell and Griffin by departmental request and emergency ordinance authorizing the director of public health to enter into one or more agreements with the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and other public or private entities to accept funding to conduct the battery-powered lawn and garden equipment rebate program authorizing the director to enter into various written standard purchase and requirement contracts needed to purchase gift cards and enter into other agreements or execute documents necessary to conduct the program. Uh, director Margolis. Yes, uh, to the chair, thank you for, for having me today. Sorry that I've been uh, camping out near the back of the room since <laughs> health health. You gotta admit, it has committee. been entertaining. It has. Uh, All right, go ahead, please, director. So, please, um, before we get any more questions. This thank legislation uh, would allow us to expand our uh, lawnmower rebate program. So we've done it in 2022. We had $20,000, half through settlement funds, half uh, through the city. Uh, we have given out 144 uh, gift cards for uh, electric mowers, and uh, an additional 56 have been committed. We require proof of both scrapping your gasoline-powered mower and proof that you've purchased uh, a battery-powered mower, and then we give you a $100 gift card. Um, this program would expand from $20,000 to $90,000 in 2023. $50,000 would come from Volkswagen for them, uh, their scandal, and $40,000 would come from the city of Cleveland. All right, um, thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any I, questions. I, I, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Real quick. I haven't asked I didn't even talk about my All right, questions. here we go. We got uh, ordinance number, uh, where, where are we at? What number? Eight, five. Lawnmowers. Eight, what is that? 885. Councilman Casey. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, to the, to, the, to, the, to the chairman, to, to the council president, where are we getting 40000 from our city council general fund? Um, through the chair to, to the council, so uh, we discussed uh, passing that through budget reconciliation from the general funds for, for the city of Cleveland for the 40000 Last year we did pass through budget reconciliation, um, or uh, earlier this year or something like that, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken. No, hold, wait, 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 remind, when, when, where, could you give more clarification on that? Yeah, so the $40,000, that would be, that was how we were discussing it would be, be passed. $50,000 was coming from 
Volkswagen scandal. Fifty thousand dollars from Volkswagen, and then in about another um, in about another week or two, we're going to be getting reconciliation funds, and that's where you're proposing getting the other forty thousand um, in reconciliation that will go to the Division of Health out of the general fund to match that fifty thousand dollars for the Volkswagen. Out of the general fund from City Council from from our allocations? No, because no. it says City Council general fund. So I think what you what that needs to say is the, the general, general fund is general. the general fund. City council does not have a that and that's yeah. that's what I'm asking. I so can we just strike agree. city council and just put general fund? Can we get okay. a motion or amendment? Okay, there. Do I have a second? All right, thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? It passes. It just be the general fund. Okay, um, Councilman Mike Polensic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not getting rid of my fossil fuel-powered lawnmower, okay? I love that smell of gasoline in the morning, okay? <laughs> You've been uh, watching too many movies. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Go ahead. Here we go, boy. Let me tell you. Oh, man. Um, the, 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 the rebate has to be used within Cuyahoga County, correct? Correct. Okay. To the chair, to the council. So we're, we're not going to benefit businesses outside of Cuyahoga County. And then do you apply to the rebate? For, how do you apply for the rebate? To the yeah, city? Or the, how do you get it? Uh, the, through the chair to the council members, so it's it's been a uh, program with a lot of outreach run by our outreach uh, part of the division of air quality, and so they do events three to five events a month. They're out there, and you just got to prove that you've scrapped it and uh, bought a lawnmower, and they'll they'll come to you to to. Make and you the have transfer. to provide you have to pr provide a receipt or something. Yep, correct. So we're just not giving away the the funds without proof of verification. Through chair to the council member, that's correct, and we're going to work with the Cleveland scrappers in the future to just make sure that we're absolutely proving because maybe okay. scrap yards are And you indicated, system. Director, how many have, have how many have been purchased already? Uh, through the chair to the council member, so we, uh, 144 so far okay. have gone through the full process with okay. an additional 56 have committed to scrapping. Okay. Gotcha. No, Mr. Chairman, believe it, I do support the program. <laughs> <laughs> I do support. But I ain't getting rid of my lawnmower. We're going to get you. Oh. I ain't getting rid of my lawnmower, okay? I like my lawnmower. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. We're going to get you in a, in a buggy. All right, Councilwoman Santana. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. I posted that this about maybe a few months ago. Yeah. So there was a deadline date with it. I mean, are we at capacity? Is this for next year through the chair? Through the chair to the council member, yes. Where that, that helped when you, when you posted that. I mm -hmm. think we got... Um, a number of folks from your ward expressed interest right away, and three uh, have followed all the way through um, from zero prior to that posting. And the, so this is for 2023. We're, we're spent for 2022, but this will be four and a half times as big for 2023. 23. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 885-2022 stands approved. Please sign on. Uh, the next piece is ordinance number 886-2022 uh, by council members Conwell and Griffin by Department of Request and Emergency Ordinance authorizing the appropriation of funds from the state of Ohio from a settlement <laughs> of opioid litigation against pharmaceutical supply chain participants and authorizing various contracts to prevent, treat, and support recovery from addiction. Uh, Director Margolis. Thank you to the chair. So this is a, a settlement funds from the Johnson and Johnson settlement. It's one hundred fifty-five thousand six hundred plus dollars per year annually for eighteen years, um, and this money uh, will come to the health department. We will spend it on all things and helping reducing deaths from opioids. Um, the Ohio. Uh, has a 63-page document that, that's attached that allows us to, you know, pick and choose as a menu to how to treat addiction. And we're keeping it broad in year one in case, you know, in three years some new invention comes along that can help treat addiction. So, Director, just real quick, how will we know what is being spent on? Um, is it Narcan? Is it educational materials? Is it all of the above? Is it consistent with the Adams Board? How is it going to be leveraged? This is one of the biggest scourges of our city. Yeah. And, um, really want to understand how that goes. Last but not least, is this the settlement that um, Attorney General Dave Yost um, agreed in, or is this something different? 
Um, through the chair to the council member, I, I think it might be something different because um, uh, what, what I've heard from our, our, our legal team is that there's more to come. So this is just, just one of, of many. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the, the programs that you mentioned, uh, chair, are exactly you know, how we would help. So broadening access to naloxone, uh, trainings, making sure there are warm handoffs to medication, uh, agonist treatment for, for opioid use disorder, uh, collecting data, just harm reduction programs in general. We can be part of all those things. In year one, it'll help us to build up our existing programs um, that have suffered through staff turnover during COVID. Uh, but year two, two and beyond, it will you know, do a lot of those different things. Okay, got it. Uh, I have Councilman Brian Casey, Councilman Mike Palencic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the director, is this 155,619.43? Is that coming to the city of Cleveland? Uh, through the chair to the council member, yes, it would be coming right. to the Department of Public Health. And then the Department of Public Health wants to then take that money and put out an RFP to distribute it throughout. Um, just Cleveland. Through the chair to the council member, no, this is staying in the city of Cleveland. This is um, it's so it's. Uh, prescribed the way we must spend this money per the settlement. Um, so there's a whole MOU from the state of Ohio that says it's got to be these evidence-based practices that reduce deaths from opioids. And, and so I've listed a few of them. And right. And then, Mr. Chairman, to the director, this isn't with, within that MOU. This isn't something that the health department has the ability to do itself. In keeping the 155,000 as opposed to putting it out for RFP? To the chair, to the council member, this is ours to keep. We are keeping this. We're not putting out an RFP. Well, it says here CDPH and OMHSA plans to post an RFP to participate in an MOU with CDPH mm -hmm. to allow local community service providers in the Cleveland area to partner with them in offering the remaining five or other core abatement strategies to offer the following services. So these, the Cleveland Department of Public Health does not or cannot has the ability to provide e these five things that you're putting here? Through the right. chair to the council member. So if you see the, the uh, you're looking at the executive summary. So the top four are going to be the focus areas of the money that we spent. Right. Um, so there are certain areas, and, and we've talked about this with the council, where um, the city should provide direct services. And then there are certain areas within the city government um, that we have strong clinical partners where we don't need to put Stella Maris or Murtis Taylor out of business because they do that really well. But these services that we're talking about are, are services that we would provide. All right, and then how much, Mr. Chairman, to the director of the 155,000 does the City of Cleveland Department of Public Health plan on keeping and how much do you plan on putting out for RFP? Through the chair to the council member, so that it's 155,619.43 per year. And so I, I can't prescribe what we'll do for you know each year of the next 18 years, but in this year, this we, year. we plan on, on, on spending it on ourselves. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Councilman Mike Palencia. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable colleagues and, and to the director. We can joke about electric um, lawnmowers, but this is, this, is, um, this is very serious here. My question is, um, the 155,000, I've noticed that, and I've read where Lake County have received a tremendous an award. What, I'm, I'm trying to understand, was this something that the city of Cleveland could have been a part of and we declined or what, what happened here that we, it seems like we, a city such as Cleveland, and I'm, I'm looking at my chairman of public safety, I'm looking at the breve reports in the police department the fentanyl deaths and the overdoses are incredible. I have never, ever seen anything like this before. It, this is like, um, uh, um, epidemic is not even, I don't even know how to describe this anymore. This is like wholesale genocide taking place in our neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. The number of people that are dying from fentanyl and it's pouring into this country uh, from the southern border. And according to CPD, where is it manufactured in China? It's, so again, we continue to give them uh, fair trade status while they're poisoning our kids in our neighborhoods. But of the $155,000, in light of the problem that we have in the city of Cleveland, 
I'm trying to think. How, um, again, just t wh wh where were we with these other settlements that we were not a part of them? Director. Yeah, through the chair to the council member. So I apologize. I had a much longer presentation this morning with the Health uh, and Human Services Committee um, just regarding my own experience treating addiction and how important this is. Uh, in nearly 10 times as many people have died the last month from opioids compared to COVID. And so I want to bring that same energy and to answer your specific question. Um, so that has to do with the, the litigation and what uh, records were kept um, and able to you know, prove the impact of uh, the negative impact of prescription opioids in our community. And so that is outside of our control for the discrepancies and how much those settlement funds were, but our legal team uh, has, has assured me that they are working on many other settlements, and so this is just the beginning. Because, I, I, what I'm not clear, Ms. direct this to the council president and to maybe our own staff, um, you know, could we have been a part of the, that litigation that, the, that Lake County uh, engaged in and we chose not to or we were deficient or negligent in being a part of it? I'm just, because again, and the hundred, I'm, I'm thankful for the 155,000, we all should be thankful for that. But the problem is so severe here. Right. We, we might have a problem far severe than they have in the entire Lake County region, just in the city of Cleveland. Through the chair to the council member, absolutely. And um, I, I am told there's more to come. So 155,619 times 18 is, is the first step to that. But okay. we're absolutely looking forward to engaging with you on this issue. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, obviously I support it. I just think that, um, and I'm hoping, the, I'm hoping to see, um, and I'll leave it, I'm hoping to see a, a, a more integrated uh, program between health and CPD um, because I see report, uh, repeat runs to individuals or to addresses who have to um, uh, provide Narcan. And somehow I would think after two or three times that we have to go to an address that something would, would tell that individual should tell us that that individual needs to get some kind of help. Yeah, that's right. Uh, repeated runs to, to a home for, right. to administer Narcan. So, okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm on board, but the problem is so, so severe, it's incredible, quite frankly. And, and Councilman, I couldn't agree with you more, and I'll share this with you. I did do a op-ed. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, the Attorney General really worked very hard um, to try to prevent cities hmm. from participating in a lot of these lawsuits too. And I actually wrote an op-ed that I'll forward um, to you that really challenged the fact that the cities should be able to get those direct Our things. Attorney General State of Ohio? The Attorney General State of Ohio tried to block cities from getting some of those okay. large settlement dollars regarding these opioids, which has been something that I wrote an op-ed on and been really pushing against um, for a long time. That's incredible. So we'll have that conversation because no. I think that that might be something we might need to follow up with a resolution. I think the voters need to understand that yeah. as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll really push that, okay? Uh, um, I um, thank you. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number uh, 886-2022 stands approved. Um, I am going to, per the request, thank you, Director, per the request of Director Wong and uh, Councilman Conwell, they're going to talk this evening and also get some input from the administration on ordinance number 895-2022. Uh, um, waiting for that proffer is when um, we'll follow up on this uh, passage. Uh, well, I already I just announced it, but my point is, you guys are going to come. I'm going to table this until next week, and then you guys, by then, will come back to us with an amendment that will be proffered, that will give us a clear structure of guideline decision making. Um, that fine. One last thing that we will do is Reso number um, 954-2022 by Council Member Griffin, an emergency resolution establishing a working committee of council, the administration, and community stakeholders to study community benefits agreement policies and ordinances and consider implementing a city policy and ordinance to ensure that development projects provide maximized tangible benefits to the Cleveland's communities and citizens and improve reporting practices and public accessibility to workforce and community benefits data and information. This basically is establishing the group that we have already started to form 
to make sure that any economic development and um, physical development projects that are going in the city of Cleveland will have an, a, a, a community benefits agreement attached to it. Uh, so I'm asking everyone to support resolution number 954-22. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number, I mean resolu resolution number 954-2022 stands approved. Uh, seeing no other piece of legislation, uh, this committee is adjourned until the council reconvenes this evening at 7 o'clock. I know we are all passionately committed to local government, which is why we signed up for our jobs. But when I think about the lives of Clevelanders, I don't think much else is more important than the outcome of the midterm, midterm elections for the lives of Clevelanders. <laughs> um, so, you know, 